Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, weirdos. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, it is our Fireside Frights episode. I usually do this once a month, but it has been quite some time since I've done one of these. In fact, it was back in mid-March that I did the last one, so <laughs> three months. So I've got a few stories that have been built up, but hopefully I can spend enough time to catch up on most of them. I will let you know that I'm a little bit on the downside today in the fact that I just came out of some outpatient, uh, outpatient surgery. Uh, nothing, nothing severe. It actually should make things a lot better for me. It's just a testosterone treatment. And I'm finally on my migraine meds. And so uh, you're seeing new episodes in the podcast after a while and now a, a new Fireside Frights. So Fireside Frights is, of course, different than what I normally do if you are new to the show. This is a little bit different than what you would uh, hear in a regular episode. On Fireside Frights, I just strip away all of the music, the sound effects, everything else. It's just you, me, this campfire, and whatever sounds nature decides to send our way. So, if you'd like to email me your true story, that's what Fireside Frights is all about. It's only stories by you, listeners to the show, the Weird Darkness Weirdo family. You can email them by going to WeirdDarkness.com and then clicking on Tell Your Story. That's WeirdDarkness.com, Tell Your Story, uh, or just send me an email, Darren at WeirdDarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Our first one comes from Rachel. She says, Hey Darren, I listen to your podcast daily. I finally got around to writing down my own paranormal experiences. Feel free to use this wherever you think it fits best. Your fellow weirdo, Rachel. And so, here's what she wrote. I wouldn't say that I believe in ghosts, but I've had experiences with the paranormal my entire life. I was born at Flo Memorial Hospital, and according to my parents, the maternity ward was haunted by a nurse who once worked there. When they would lay me in my crib, I would coo and giggle at someone or something in my nursery. They witnessed the mobile above my bed move without being wound up, and the rocking chair would rock without anyone sitting in it. Thankfully, she was a good spirit, it, uh, if, if that was in fact what it was. Of course, I have no remembrance of these happenings. The next experience I have is years later. My parents had moved across the state to a small farm and moved in an old farmhouse. They remodeled it and added rooms for me and my younger brother and sister, so it was a pretty big house. We're celebrating Christmas about 20 years ago. Everyone's in the front of the house where we had opened gifts, and the kids were playing with their new toys. I went to the back of the house where the bedrooms and bathrooms were. No one was back there. It was dark, lights off, no television, no radio was on. From the darkness, I heard a small child singing the Christmas carol, We Three Kings. I spun around and headed back to the living room with everyone else. Again, I think it was a benevolent spirit, but I didn't want to find out. Shortly after my husband and I married, we moved into the house where he grew up. His father had tragically died when my husband was about 11. We lived in the house for about four years. The entire time we lived there, no one ever smoked in the house. However, I often smelled cigarette smoke wafting through the house. My husband's father was a heavy smoker. I think the cigarette smell was him drifting in to check on his son. About five years ago, my husband and I moved into a house across town. I did not like going into the east side of the house where the guest bedrooms were. However, I did hang a few pictures and crosses in that hallway. Once the crosses, uh, oh, one of the crosses was given to me in memory of my grandmother who had passed away the year before. One afternoon, I heard a buzzing, like an electrical buzzing coming from the hallway. I investigated and it was coming from that cross. I don't know what compelled me, but I said, Mama, you can go. 
and the buzzing stopped. The two years we lived in that house, we would hear scraping at night. The living room had a Spanish tile floor, and the noise sounded like someone dragging something heavy across the tile. My husband would check, but never saw anything moved. We started sleeping with the bedroom door closed and locked. The final experience I had happened about nearly three years ago. My husband and I moved again. He was in law enforcement and concerned with security. We had cameras all around our house and even alerts on our phones. When either of us came within a certain radius of our home, the other would get an alert stating, Alex is arriving home or Rachel has left home. We also had a ring doorbell camera that signaled our phones and we could automatically connect and talk to whoever was at the front door. Well, as you know, the corona pandemic hit in the spring of 2020, and my husband was part of the first responders who could not shelter in place. He became very sick from the virus and passed away July 11, 2020. After he died, I got an alert on my phone stating, Alex is arriving home. I've been in possession of his phone and smartwatch for the past week, the night of his funeral, my phone alerted with the Ring doorbell camera. This was about 3 a.m. I picked up my phone and switched to the live view. I saw an orb and heard the crackling sound that's heard on the paranormal shows. I wasn't scared this time either. I felt at peace, like my husband was just finding his way home. Today, I'm in a new house with a feisty black cat. So far, knock on wood, I haven't had any more experiences since then. I'd like to keep it that way. Rachel, I am so sorry for your loss. That has got to be devastating. I cannot imagine what life would be like without my bride, Robin. Um, and I'm sure it was very much the same for you when you lost your husband. Goodness gracious. Um, ex almost exactly three years ago today. So I am... I'm, I'm very sorry for your loss. I'm sure this is a really horrible time of year for you. And uh, if I had known that, I, I, I might have skipped this email until the next Fireside Frights so it wouldn't be so fresh. But as I've mentioned in the past, I don't read these in advance for Fireside Frights. I just pick them up and just start going so my, you know, so my reactions are genuine and, and off the cuff. But I'm really, really sorry for your loss. Uh, yeah, the, the, the cross, though, with uh, your mama uh, looks like she... Uh, she was possessing that cross, which is interesting. Uh, normally, when you hear possessed objects, you don't think of something religious like that. But yeah, there you go. We have a, uh, in our in our home, not in our home, in our family, that is, we have a, uh, a, a grandfather clock. I've talked about this, I believe, in the past in Fireside Frights, but we have a grandfather clock that is supposedly haunted by my grandmother. I knew my grandmother before she passed away, really nice lady. But apparently, there was a lot of tension about the clock uh, within the family. The, uh, the siblings were fighting over it, and I don't know exactly how that went. I really don't need to know. It's none of my business. Um, but anyway, my dad ended up with the grandfather clock, and he has had visitations from my grandmother, his mother, since her passing. And it's not just in the house. He moved into the house that she was in at first in order to take care of her in her in her last days. And so then I could kind of see where her ghost might be there. But when he moved away from Kansas City and moved to Texas and took the grandfather clock with him, she still visited him there. So we are pretty darn sure that it's the grandfather clock because... Uh, after that, they moved to Arkansas for a while and moved back to Texas again a little bit later on, and they've they've had a couple of incidents with the, the clock. And Well, it's my dad. It's not the clock itself. It's not like there's anything wrong with the clock. It's not doing anything. But my dad seems to be a bit more sensitive to stuff like this. I did not inherit that. I know that I'm the one who tells all the spooky tales, um, and he's not really into spooky tales. He's not into scary stories and, and horror movies and anything, probably because he gets enough of it in real life with uh, just seeing stuff like this once in a while. But uh, yeah, so when the day comes that my father passes away, it's possible that I'll be inheriting that grandfather clock or possibly my little brother. 
it would make more sense for my little brother because he actually does have a son who could, he, he could hand it down to and keep it in the family. But anyway, one of us is going to get that grandfather clock more than likely. I'm just wondering if the ghost is going to come with it. So, th Rachel, thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate your email. This next one comes from Crystal. Crystal says, first off, I'd like to say I love the podcast. I just love all the variety of stories you tell. Okay, I've been holding on to this story for a very long time because I've been too scared to share it online. I'm afraid that some younger people might try this, so please make it absolutely apparent that this is incredibly dangerous and could have horrific, deadly consequences. With that disclaimer, I would really like to see if anybody has, had, has any idea what it was I actually experienced, as I've never heard another story like it. So here we go. It was either 1996 or 97. I was a preteen at a slumber party participating in all the dumb things preteens at slumber parties did back in the 90s. I remember the party was from my mom's boyfriend's daughter, so I didn't know anyone at the party other than the birthday girl. We were watching scary movies, so I'll admit that Nightmare on Elm Street was on my mind. However, I'd been watching scary movies since I was quite young and didn't get scared by them, and this was like my third time seeing this particular movie. Anyway, moving on. One of the girls started talking about a time she was at a party and played a game called Pass Out and described what it was, basically making someone pass out. I called Bull. I truly did not think that you could make another person pass out. I just thought it was something that happened naturally, like in the movies, when a woman is shocked and passes out as a man catches her. The girl said she would prove it, so I went along with it and I volunteered because I didn't want them trying to trick me by pretending to pass out. Okay, here's where it gets weird. So I did everything they told me to do and eventually the world went blank. Or black, so. By, by the way, uh, Crystal, thank you very much for not detailing exactly how to play this game. I appreciate that. Yeah, it would have been dangerous to go through that. So anyway, she says, then suddenly I was in a dark... All right, so, so she does it, she passes out, the world goes black. Suddenly I was in a dark alley. Everything was in black and white. There were pipes everywhere, and I could hear water dripping very loudly. Something was coming for me, and I started to run. It was chasing me, and I was terrified for my life. But the only sound I could hear was water dripping and a strange hum. I felt like I was running forever, and everything about this felt real. Eventually, I woke up from this, but everything was blurry. There was a group of girls all standing around me, pointing and laughing their butts off, but I couldn't make out their faces. I didn't know who they were or where I was. I was lying on a pile of teddies on the opposite end of the room. It took me a few minutes to remember what had happened and where I was, but I was extremely disoriented and felt absolutely sick head pounding, heart racing, nauseous, and covered in sweat. When everyone finally stopped laughing, they told me how that was a good one and that I got them real good. I had no idea what they were talking about. According to them, after I passed out, I started kicking and flaring my arms all over the place. My legs were going up the walls, and I went all around the whole room like a woman possessed until ending up in the pile of teddies where I stopped for a while and was completely still before coming to. It was apparently terrifying for them, and they thought I played a prank on them to freak them out. None of them ever believed me that I did not, and oh, that I that I wasn't um, freaking them out on purpose. Um, very few people in my life have ever believed this story when I've told it. I'm not going to lie, I tried to make it happen again multiple times with other friends and never could. Again, I cannot stress this enough, this is a terrible idea, and I've probably lost brain cells due to it. But anytime I played the game again, I'd just pass out for a couple of minutes and then come to, with no dreaming of any kind, only blackness. Some have suggested to me that perhaps I had a seizure, but I've researched it and I really don't think that's what happened. Also, nothing like it ever happened before or since. Some have said that I had a near-death experience and saw hell. But I was just a kid. I, I really think that that's bull. Did I shift realities, time travel, or see a past life or something? I really have no idea. Over the years, I've tried to look up people having crazy experiences like this when playing this game, but I haven't come across anything. 
Has anyone else experienced something like this? I think about this probably more than I should. I've never forgotten it, and I never will. It was crazy weird, and whether scientific or supernatural, I hope someone out there can shed some real light on what actually happened. Holy cow, Crystal! Uh, yeah, dangerous. Please, people, if you're listening, don't do this. Please don't do this. Obviously, for one reason, because you're passing out, That which means blood is not getting to your brain. So the comment that Crystal makes that she could be losing brain cells, it's very, very uh, possible that that's what is happening. But the idea that she went through all of this weird stuff the near-death experience almost sounds right. I don't... I mean, how many people go through a weird, uh, a near-death experience and come back and, and are able to say exactly what happened to them? Uh, the, you don't have the typical near-death stuff in the fact that you're not seeing the light, you're not being asked to come down a hallway or go somewhere else, you're not hearing a voice saying, no, it's not your time, you need to go back, nothing like that. So I'm not really sure if it would be an actual near-death experience. What I'm inclined to say, and I'm not an expert in this, so please don't take my word for this. You still need to do your research, Crystal. You need to keep looking for an answer. But my, I'm inclined to say this is similar to what would happen if you're inviting a spirit in to talk to you through like a Ouija board or spirit board or tarot cards or something like that. You're opening yourself up to... Uh, an outside influence. And, uh, you know, sometimes you risk that influence being a bad influence. And if you are purposely knocking yourself out, I'm wondering, I don't know exactly how you guys went about knocking yourselves out, and I don't need to know, uh, but I'm just wondering if perhaps that just allowed a door to open for something to come into you and just mess with you for a short while. I don't know. It would make sense uh, because you said that you've not forgotten about this. You think about it more than you probably should. So it's definitely something that has affected your life in a negative way for a long time. So that that would be my that would be my guess. But yes, please start keep doing research. If you find an answer to this, I would love to know. And uh, weirdo family members, if you're listening to this and you know what happened to Crystal. Do me a favor, drop me an email at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren, again, is spelled D-A-R-R-E-N. And just like in the subject line or something, write, you know, pass out game or something along those lines so I know what you're referring to. So in the next Fireside Frights, we can refer to this and see if maybe we have an answer for Crystal. But again, thank you very much for the email, Crystal. I appreciate it. Uh, Kelly sent one saying, Hey, Darren, this is my encounter with the ghost of my friend's father. Okay. Um, this is actually a fairly long one. So let me get a sip of my drink here real quick. Uh, I always tell people what I'm drinking. I am drinking uh, Diet Mountain Dew with, uh, with, with... I'm putting flavoring in it. Uh, Mayo Energy with caffeine and B vitamins in it. So I'm doubling up on the caffeine. I'm also getting through some B vitamins into this. Uh, Okay. Oh, uh, in case you're wondering, um, a, a Kai Berry Storm. That's the that's the flavor that I'm using right now. Okay. So uh, Kelly says. Oh, she even titled it "Haunted Happenings: The Ghost of His Father and Paranormal Experiences." I had a series of paranormal experiences that have happened to me this year, but it all happened almost a year ago. That's when this guy came back into my life. The odd thing is, the minute we started talking again, we noticed all these similarities that we had. We are both Earth signs, similar life experiences, and his brother having the same birthday as me. Then it became more than that. We noticed we could message each other the same exact word or sentence at the same time. Then there were times where we spoke the same things at the same time, and sometimes when we spoke, it was a whole sentence at the same time. Then, at times, we would know what the other one was thinking. It felt like it was an intense connection at the time, and we were drawn to each other. We had the same dream one time. I had dreams of him, so uh, some would come true. He told me that he had a dream of me. 
I'm not sure if it was only once, but he did say he had a dream that uh, that scared him of me. He said he saw something bad happen to me. I then noticed that I could pick up his feelings. Some days it was overwhelming. One time I remember just crying out of nowhere. I was not even sad, and later that day he said that he was upset. I also remember waking up in the middle of the night and feeling panicked. I'd message him and ask him if he was okay, and he'd say no. I remember a few times talking to him, and I just knew the color of the shorts he was wearing, or his socks. Then when we would hang out, things would get intense, especially at the beginning. When we first started hanging out, unexplainable things would happen. The television would just turn on by itself. We would look for the remote control. It was always under the bed and in the middle. I'd never forget the time when so many things happened all at once. First, his television turned on. Then it went off. Then everything went off. One by one, his lights, our cell phones, and air conditioning all turned off. I got chills all over me that night. I definitely felt someone was there with us. He always knew it was his dad. He told me that mainly his dad was coming around more when I was there. He told me that one time his phone flew across the room and he saw his dad that passed away. One time when we were talking on the phone, he told me that a plant that was in his room fell over about four times. He also saw 1111 and 111 on his phone that day. Another time that we were talking on the phone, he said that you left one of your shirts at my house. Then he said the shirt moved from one end of the couch to the other. I laugh when I think back to seeing an angel, seeing uh, angel numbers with him. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm not familiar with angel numbers, Skelly. So sorry. Sorry for the pause on that. Anyway, I laugh when I think back to seeing angel numbers with him because he did not believe in angel numbers. The first night that we saw angel numbers, he was actually trying to tell me that you can look at your phone and see any number. He put his phone in the kitchen to charge. We talked for hours in his room, and I had no idea what time it was. He went into the kitchen to look at his phone. It was exactly 11, 11 p.m. After that day, it became a regular thing for us to see angel numbers. It was always 11, 11 and 1, 11. It was to the point where you could not deny it. We never really paid attention to the time when we were together, so when we saw the angel numbers, we knew that it was a sign. The clock in my car was broken, and I remember we were driving and laughing, and when we stopped my car, it was exactly 1.11 according to my clock. Another time, I looked at my Facebook, and I had exactly 1,111 friends, and his face and name was next to the number. Or I would have 111 emails. It felt like things were trying to get our attention. We even had some similar health issues at one point. It was the same eye condition, and it was at the same time. One time he told me that he put a crystal that I gave him under his bed. He took a nap and he woke up to my crystal hitting the wall and startling him. Another time he was on his phone and he said that he was on social media. Then all of a sudden, one of my YouTube videos about wolves popped up and he can't explain how. And as I just wrote that I heard two knocks on my wall, which is strange because not too long ago we asked his dad to give us two knocks if it was him. I had different dreams of him. One time I had a dream of him falling, but I saw him fall in the bathroom, but he fell outside. It's strange, but sometimes that's what happens in my dreams. They turn out a little different. I had a dream of his dad once, and it was odd. He seemed like he was worried and trying to get a message through. I only, rem I only remember him asking what was the problem with his son and I. It's kind of funny because I always wondered the same thing. He was acting as a counselor in the dream in between the two of us and seemed as if he was trying to help. Then this guy ended up moving into my building. When I went into his apartment, we still had the same strange things happen. Weird knocks, strange sounds, and his socks falling off his shelf. I asked him one night if I could perform a seance to try to contact his dad and maybe get some messages from him. He agreed to this. At the time, we happened to be in my apartment. We heard 14 noises. All the noises sounded like knocks on a wall. It's funny that the number 14 is the day I was born. Then we went back to his place. 
Before I left my place, I told his dad that he had to go back with him, or if any other ghosts were there as well, they had to leave. So we got back to his place, and I said, let's try to ask again because we started to hear the noises again. The minute I said, if this is his father, then please knock twice if you have a message for him, instantly we heard two knocks. Then it kept happening. The next day, he told, he, uh, told me he felt like it was really overwhelming because now the knocks just keep happening all the time. He and I parted ways now. I stopped talking to him because he was toxic and he just kept treating me really badly. I still do see him in my dreams sometimes. However, the dreams are different now. One night I had a dream I met a new guy and it was my wedding day, and I was wondering what this guy would have thought of me getting married and if he cared anymore. Another dream that I had was me moving out of my apartment that I'm living in and him trying to find me, but he could not. But a really creepy thing just happened recently. I walked into a store and it was just me and three other people in the store. The store owner kept teasing this little boy. The little boy was looking at mood rings, and the color of his mood ring meant love. All of a sudden, his sister kept calling his name and she said that it was time to go. He just so happened to have the name of the guy that this story is about. Then things just took a real weird turn. I left that store and walked a few blocks away and just felt drawn to this other store. I went in there and all of a sudden the little boy that was trying on mood rings came up to me. He looked right at me and said, look, it's her. He kept saying it over and over again. He kept telling his sister to look that it was me, the lady from the other store. And they kept calling his name once again. It was the same name of the man this story is about. Thank you, Kelly. Um, okay, okay. Everybody wants my opinions on stories and my thoughts. And again, I need to reiterate, I'm not an expert. Kelly has a, a different lifestyle than I do. And so, so she's going to dive into things that I would never dive into. I, when she mentioned that she's doing a seance, right then, right then in there, red flags, red lights, beep, 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 don't do that, beep, 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 don't do that. Uh, but that's, <laughs> that's because I'm a born-again Christian, so I'm not going to step into stuff like that. But, I mean, if you're not a Christian and, and you're maybe Wiccan or Pagan or whatever, you don't see an issue with it. So I, I totally get that. But I'm wondering, okay, as I was reading this, Kelly... There are a couple of things popped into my head. Number one, I wondered if the guy was actually messing with you, playing with you, because there are people who really can. Almost, they can all. It almost make it makes it look like they're mind reading you. They can say the same word or same sentences like right at the same time as you. It is a. It's a weird thing, but you can look it up on YouTube. People will be able to do that type of thing. Texting each other back and forth and having the exact same word at the same time. I'm not exactly sure how that worked, uh, but I'm, it was just something that popped into my head. And if you say you were dreaming about him, he could so easily just say, oh yeah, 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 I'm dreaming about you too, yeah, yeah, yeah. So whether or not he was telling the truth, I don't know. That doesn't explain the weird stuff that starts happening later on, it was just something that kind of occurred to me while I was reading this. And then you get into the angel numbers, and I think I kind of figured out what you were talking about with that, where you start seeing the same number everywhere and for no apparent reason. Um, like there was that movie 23, uh, or was it Room 23? Uh, anyway, um, you know, you start seeing that same number everywhere that he goes. And you were, you were seeing the number 11 or 111 or 1111. You know, it's like the, the number, the, a string of ones everywhere you went. Uh it is kind of weird when that happens. I think that's probably happened to most everybody, not to the extent that you're talking about. I mean, it's just a couple of times you know, during the day you might do it. I know people who will post online, hey, look at that, my phone just says 1111. They'll like, take a screenshot and send it out like it's something, it's like it's some big deal. I don't get it, but okay. But I, you mentioned that you're thinking maybe it's a sign. I want to know why. What sign would that be? If it's the spirit world, the paranormal, supernatural, whatever, trying to get a message to you, what possible message would that be? Hey, look, here's a string of number, here's a string of ones. Now, go out and do whatever it is that that message tells you to do. What, what is that? I, 
that makes zero sense to me. If they really wanted to get a message to you, come back, you know, come to you and start speaking to you in English, tell you exactly what it is they want you to do, or at least give you some hints. But just a string, a string of numbers like that makes no sense at all. Uh, I know that they're just called angel numbers because I seriously doubt that's actually from angels because that I would think angels, the angels being messengers, that's actually what they were created to be, are messengers. That's the worst message ever if you're trying to get a point across to somebody. <laughs> that's all I'm saying. I'm kind of glad that you're no longer with this guy because, uh, yeah, it sounded like he was, yeah, well, you, you used the word toxic and even... Without his personality, I don't know his personality, but what was happening between the two of you definitely sounded toxic, very unhealthy, even if you loved each other very much. You didn't mention if you were actually boyfriend, girlfriend. I'm assuming that's what you were, but even if you were just friends, either way, you can be really close to somebody and truly, truly love somebody, either you know emotionally, romantically, whatever. Uh, you can be as close as close can be to somebody and and love them very much and be happy and still kind of be toxic at the same time. I mean, it, it is possible for that to happen. So I'm glad that you two are no longer together. Interesting that your dreams changed after that and you're still kind of wondering what he thinks of you. I think that's probably the case for all of us when it comes to past relationships. He's obviously still on your mind somehow. I still have, uh, I still have dreams about old girlfriends from goodness gracious, like high school. My high school girlfriend will step into my my dreams once in a while, because once in a while she, she pops into my head, So even if I don't think about it. So I don't think it's necessarily, you know, an odd thing that you're dreaming about your ex. Uh, the little boy, it was try trying on the mood rings, probably just a coincidence when it came to the name, unless, unless you're, you're, uh, old friend, guy, friend, boyfriend, whatever, had an, a very strange name, you know, a very unique name. Uh, other than that, I would think that's just just a coincidence. And you just happened to be at a couple of different stores when that same kid was there. That's, But still, uh, anyway, very interesting, though. Really glad you're not with him. That's all I can say. All right, moving on. Uh, our next, next one comes from uh, Kyle. He says, hey, Darren, uh, here's some backstory and context to my story. My wife and I have been married for going on two years now and been together since December of 2017. For when we first met, she told me she can see ghosts and feel them as well. She sees them all over the place and will normally tell me about it. I have no reason to doubt her. We bought a house a couple years ago and sometimes ghosts visit us and ask her for help. She tries to ignore them for the most part, but sometimes she does tell them what they need or want. Now, normally I can't see or sense them, but I don't know if it's because we have been together for so long or if they trust me or what, but I've been able to feel like I notice things kind of off when one is around, which brings me to the story. When one needs help or directions or whatever, they normally appear and kind of follow my wife around for a bit, but this time something different's going on. The last month or so, we have been dealing with what we both believe to be a small child, maybe three to five years old. Now, I say we because it's letting me get the full experience, too. It started out by one night at maybe midnight or so by knocking stuff off our dresser and getting the feeling of someone coming up onto our bed and sitting down by our feet. We felt the depression in the bed and everything. It also grabbed my wife's... Uh, hand, I'm, I'm assuming, I think he left a word out there, my wife's hand and to hold it. A couple days later, we had put my son down to bed. He's two years old. After an hour or so of him sleeping, we heard a small child screaming and crying, Daddy! Instinctually, we thought it was our son, so I ran upstairs and opened his door to see him sound asleep. The screaming and crying continued with the daddies in the hall as I looked at him sound asleep. Once I went back into the hall, the crying and the daddies stopped. So it creeped, uh, so creeped out, I went downstairs and told my wife that it wasn't our son. Now, this is weird for us because this time the ghost isn't letting my wife see it and it's letting me hear and experience stuff too. Later, when we went upstairs for bed, we noticed that the ghost had put a ball in front of our room as if it wanted to play. I know the ball wasn't there earlier when I checked on my son. 
Randomly, we'll hear it moving around or uh, moving around our house, running up and down our stairs, and even shutting doors. We even heard it whistle. We don't think our house is haunted because we've lived in it for over two years and never had anything happen like this till recently. We just don't know what it is. My wife has asked it many times if she can help, but she doesn't get any feedback. Just what it wants to do. I wanted to share what we're dealing with in hopes you might share it on a podcast to see if any weirdo listeners have heard of anything like this happening or have any idea why it doesn't want help. I just hope it's not something pretending to be a child in hopes that we want it to stay LOL. Thanks again. Feel free to share our story if you want to. Thanks again. Love the podcast. Thanks. That's, sign. That's uh, Kyle. Kyle, wow. Um, that, your story reminds me a little bit of the old film with George C. Scott, uh, Changeling, or The Changeling, not to be confused with the Angelina Jolie movie. That's that's a different Changeling. But, uh, you know, the idea of a child haunting the house, wanting to play ball, that, that's what really caught me was the was the ball. Uh, you say that so you've been there for a couple of years, nothing's happened up, until, up to this point. Uh, but I'm wondering, have you done anything to the house recently? Quite often from what I've read and, and learned, not from personal experience, but just from telling so many stories, quite often a haunting won't begin until something triggers it. And it can often be renovations in a house, almost like the house, uh, like the previous owner doesn't like what you're doing to the house or it uh, stirs something up, you know, spiritually, I, you know, however you want to take that. So I'm wondering if that could possibly be it. It's interesting. It's a tiny little child. I, I'm wondering, too, if it's not just pretending to be a small child. So if you are not doing any renovations, then I have to wonder, have you opened yourself up to some type of spiritual infestation, for lack of better words? Have you done a seance recently? Have you um, played with tarot cards recently or seen a, a, a fortune teller or... Have you, and, and I'm not accusing, but uh, have you committed some horrible, horrible sin that you're keeping a secret? Like maybe you've, like maybe somebody in your house has cheated on each other, or um, maybe there's a, maybe somebody has stolen money of a great value and is keeping it a secret. Because stuff like that, uh, from, and I'm getting this from uh, Father Carlos Martin from the, another podcast that I listen to often uh, called The Exorcist Files, and he's mentioned that sometimes you can just commit a what's considered a mortal sin, and it's kind of like inviting somebody in. So you don't even have to be playing a, a dangerous spiritual game for it to happen. Just living that life can sometimes bring it in. So I really don't know, though. Um, your wife asks often if she can help and the spirit doesn't want help. That doesn't mean that you have to put up with it, though. Uh, if you don't want the kid there, if it's freaking you out, and I can't Im I'm wondering what your kids, what your actual two-year-old son, how he's handling to this. You, you haven't mentioned that. I'm wondering, is this like an imaginary friend for him as well? Does he sometimes play with the ghost? That would really concern me. Yeah, it's one thing to have your kid with an imaginary child that you don't see or hear from or anything. It could just be there. It could be just their imagination. But when something, when you start getting evidence that it's a real entity, then you know that's that's where you get concerned. So I would wonder if your son is also seeing, hearing this spirit. But I, man, if it was me, I would just be. I'd be calling a, a priest or a pastor over, and or I would definitely be blessing the house. I would go out and get either make holy water if you know how to do it, or you can just uh, get some olive oil. Uh, it has to be uh, it has to be natural organic, I think oil. Gosh, my mind is freezing up on me, folks. I'm sorry, but anyway, look it up. You can look up how how to bless your home with holy water and holy oil, and you can go about doing that. Um, I th but I think you can just use olive oil and just make the sign of a cross over all the entrances in your home, uh, you know, that, that kind of thing. Ask the spirits to leave. 
uh, ask God to bless your home and to protect you from all all spirits that are not of Him. You know that kind of thing. So, but yeah, if there are any weirdos listening that know what that's about, drop me an email. Let me know. We'll put it in the next Fireside Frights. And for that subject line, maybe just say two-year-old ghost, and we can uh, take it from there. Thanks for your email, Kyle. I appreciate it. All right, this next one comes from, let's see, I want to make sure that they, uh, Jen. All right, so we'll go with Jen. Uh, Hello, I have a weird story. Just started listening not too long ago. Good times. Decided to share my weird story because I think it's funny and it's an option here. Let's start the story with some background info. I'm an only child to a single mother who worked and went to school to get degrees and all that jazz. My grandmother would babysit me, but she would often need rest until noon, so I played alone in her house. So anyway, sometimes we would go shopping for things that she needed and would often buy me toys. She got me this giant baby doll about the size of a toddler but designed to look like a sleeping infant. It would close its eyes when you laid it down, and I carried it with me all the time. Jump forward a few years in my pre-teens. I was feeling really down because I felt very alone. I heard a voice that said I was not alone, and it brought me great comfort, and I was flooded with fantastic images of beautiful creatures and people. Pale white skin, black nails, horns, wings, fangs. I guess some would see them as demons or vampires. From that point on, the one who spoke to me was at my side. He had a few forms, which I liked to draw out. I assumed I had gone crazy due to isolation and lack of friends, maybe schizophrenia, but sensitive people saw him or could feel something with me well into my older teen and adult years. Back to my story about the doll. I still had her many years later, but she was super banged up. She lost an eye, which I replaced with a black marble, and I uh, I painted her up to look like my demon vampire friend. My mom was unnerved. <laughs> I bet she was. <laughs> but I loved that doll. So at some point in my childhood, around grade school, uh, still with no human friends, my mom had arranged a sleepover with a few girls from my class. I wasn't really for this. I really just wanted to play with my dolls, draw, and read books. Side note, for punishment, she would take away my books and make me go outside to play. So the girls came over. We have pizza and snacks. They talk about things like cute boys and play with each other's hair. I awkwardly try to join them, but I didn't think anybody was cute and didn't like being touched. I tried to talk about cool animal facts, but they didn't care. Eventually, they pushed me out of my own bedroom and I went to sleep on the couch. I was woken up partly because I heard my door open and I see them toss out my creepy baby doll, mostly still asleep. I see her wink at me and start to stand up, but at that point I was already falling back to sleep. I dismissed it as a dream, but in the morning the girls are silent and seemed disturbed about something. They ask me if I put the doll back in my room. I tell them no, and my mom asked what they were talking about. They asked her if she put it back, but she didn't either. They told her they put the doll out because it was creepy, but it was back when they woke up. The door was still closed, but the doll was back in her corner of the bed. My bedroom door is not silent. It doesn't creak, but the latch makes a very loud pop when when uh, turned due to the door being set wrong. To close it, you have to push it with your whole body to get the latch, which is noisy. And opening the, and uh, opening the door to get in is like opening a can of biscuits while a cat plays with a doorknob. Pop, rattle, rattle, clack, clack. Not something you can ignore very easily. My mom was shocked at this, but didn't really believe them. But saw their faces as genuinely scared. One girl cried when they realized it wasn't me or my mom. They all went home and didn't talk to me at school, which was normal. But now they actively avoided me. I wasn't upset at that. Why would anyone want to be friends with people who kick you out of your own bedroom at a sleepover at your house? As for my doll, I still have her. She's in storage, though, not because I'm scared of her or anything. She spent many years on my bed through my childhood and some of my teen years. She traveled with me when I moved around, and when I could, and when I, could I would set her up with my other plushies when I had space. I'm in my 40s now, and married. We have our own house with two dogs and not much room on the bed. 
She's comfortably stored away in a nice box with other toys from my childhood or newer dolls I've collected because I like plushies. One day I hope to pass her on to my own child, or at least get her out of storage when we finally organize the house. I don't know if it was my friend or the doll itself, but I'm happy about it either way. He likes to play coy with with uh, some things. I'll probably share some more stories with him later, maybe. I'll ask if he's okay with that. He's pretty open with things. Thanks for reading, listening, and I hope Miss Mocha is enjoying the cat toys. Remember, if you don't believe in yourself, that's fine because Satan believes in you. Much love. Signed, Jen. Yeah, Jen's actually uh, one of the vendors uh, that I've that I've met at these places that I go. Uh, Genocide Doll, if you want to look at her, uh, or if you want to look at her stuff online, I believe that's what her Instagram uh, profile is, Genocide Doll. But and yes, uh, she loves it. So thank you very much, Jen. I appreciate that. Miss Mocha really lo well. She loves toys in general. <laughs> Welcome to being a cat. Your story sounds so much like the real story of Annabelle the doll. Not the movie, but the actual Annabelle doll. Because that's something where they would try to get rid of the doll. The three girls in that house tried to get rid of it, tried to throw her away a couple times. She would end up back uh, not only at their doorstep, but actually in the room, uh, stuff like that. And nobody would fess up to going out and getting her and bringing her back. Very much like the Annabelle doll, which makes me think that, that doll might possibly have a demonic connection, especially after you you talk about your friend. I guess I will call it an imaginary friend that looks like a demon. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say demons actually look like that. That's the way we portray them now because anything with with points seems to be uh, seems to be bad, and with curves seems to be good. Um, I, I learned that actually from a Disney animator, and he was saying that if you look at the if you look at the for example, the uh, wicked, the wicked queen. Oh well, no, no, no. Let's let's go with um, Maleficent from Sleeping Beauty. You'll see that she's got the horns with pointy with the, with points, but also her facial features are jagged and pointed, and that's easier easier to portray as a as a bad person. As uh, you know, they're they're the antagonist in the story, where Sleeping Beauty herself has these fine curvy lines, no no, no jaggedness at all. She's very flowing. Uh, so, makes me... I think that's why we started creating demons you know, in pictures and stuff like that, because it's just easier to see them as, well, demonic that way. But that doesn't mean that they actually look that way. In fact, I'm guessing that demons probably uh, look very much like, well, whatever they want to look like. They have the ability to change. But, uh, the, like the TV show Lucifer, it would not surprise me if, de if demons look like that, just like normal people who just happen to go around doing really, really nasty, awful things. And they they don't have wings either. Uh, the, well, I'm not going to say they don't have wings. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that angels or slash demons have wings. Uh, so, I mean, they can move from one place to the next in, in an instant, but that doesn't require wings. You know, it, that's just supernatural. Anyway, thank you very much for the story, Genocide. Uh, I appreciate that. Um... Gosh, I, you have to wonder what your doll thinks of being stuck in storage right now. When you take her out and you decide to set her up again, what does your spouse think of that? <laughs> is that is your spouse? I don't know if it's a he or she, so I'm just saying spouse. But but or they? I'll just say they. What? How do they react when you bring back the doll? I'm, I would be curious to see what kind of a reaction you get from that. Thank you very much, Jen. I appreciate it. Tori sent me this next one saying, Hey, this was a while ago, so I'll try to recall with as much detail as I can. This is another long one. Let me get a sip here real quick. Oh, goodness. We're already 10 minutes away from being an hour. And I've got a ton of stuff still left to go. I don't, I don't think I'll get through all of it today, but still. All right. Here's Tori's email. I was about 19 years old, maybe, when this happened. I was working two jobs in Evansville, Wisconsin, and lived in Magnolia Township at that time. Job one was housekeeping at the nursing home, and job two was in home care for an autistic child in town. She was about 15, I think, at that time. And for the sake of her privacy, I will call her Maggie in this story. Maggie was mostly mute, 
and what some would call on the more severe side of autistic. Prone to fits of teenaged frustration, but also very small, childlike in play and cognitive abilities. We got along so well it was like having a younger sister to hang with. At the time, uh, I was coming from a rough background as well. Abusive parents had kept me very isolated growing up, and it was nice to have someone to pal around with. Working with her was a mostly physical job. We had a two-seater bike that we'd go on quite long rides together on. We'd go play at the parks or really anything to get her out of the house and wear her out a little for her parents. We went to the middle... By, by the way, before I continue on here, I think that's really cool, Tori. I know that that was your job, but it's really cool that that's what you decided to step into and, and do. It takes a very special person to work with special needs kids. So kudos to you for that before we even continue with the rest of your email. Okay, anyway, we went to the middle school park one day and noticed a tan and gray mismatched sedan parked in the parking lot beside the playground. A kind of sketchy looking dude was in the driver's seat watching us intently. I kept looking over my shoulder at him as Maggie played on the swings with me seated beside her and I didn't like the looks of him. Eventually, I asked Maggie if she wanted to go to the, at the time, newly built park out in the new subdivision. Now, I didn't say that directly. I asked her if she wanted to go make sand castles. The park we were at has mulch as a substrate. The new one had sand, which I was perpetually, which was perpetually damp for some reason, excellent for building. Her way of saying yes was to hop off the swing and start towards the bike. We got in and I took a winding way to the new park, where we got busy making our little city of sand. It wasn't long, though, that guy came to this park, this time rolling up close to watch again. I made a point to watch him back, make sure he knew that I saw him, and eventually we left and went back to Maggie's house. I told her dad I saw a guy being sketchy towards Maggie, and I didn't like it, and he kind of blew me off. Now, Maggie was pretty, very small build, cute, teen girl, and I'm solidly convinced the only thing it would take for her to hop into a stranger's car would be to offer be an offer of candy or a cell phone to play on. So I was worried for her safety and upset with her dad for not seeming concerned at all. For a while, we saw this guy daily everywhere we went, and I still pleaded with Maggie's dad, mom, and older sisters to watch out for this guy and his car. Something was up, but no one seemed phased. A little later on, you know, before I go on, I would be calling the cops. I don't care what Maggie's mom and dad say. If they're not concerned, you're concerned. You should definitely, I would have been calling the cops and say, hey, look, this guy's following us. He's a, he's a creep. So just check up on him. You know, it just the idea, just a cop showing up and asking questions is often enough uh, to scare somebody away for good. That's all, that, that's all I'm saying. All right, moving, moving on with your, with your email. A little later on, we were at Lake Leota, a little park in town with a crumbling man-made channel to guide a small creek through the park. Maggie liked to sit on the banks and further erode the crumbled concrete on the side by picking at it. I was sitting beside her, holding my usual one-sided conversation with her, when I noticed a car pull up on the road across the channel from us, like maybe 500 feet away, tops. Right there, out in front of everyone, was that same old gray-slash-tan sedan but this time a woman was standing behind it with a comically large camera, leaned across the top of the car, photographing us. I was bewildered for more than one reason. First, that was definitely the car. Second, who is this lady? And thirdly, how in the world did she think she was being at all covert? I watched her a second, pondering all this, and tapped Maggie's shoulder, pointing at the lady and saying, look, we're getting our picture taken, say hi, and waved. Maggie waved as well, causing a weird reaction in the woman who looked horrified, bolted upright, rushed around the car, got in the driver's side, and literally squeal-tired to speed away. I was so confused. Now, here's where things get fuzzy. I don't remember if this is the day or the next day when this next bit happened. It was in the same location, but as we had taken the double bike to the park, I turned around to get it to, uh, get it to leave. Now, about that bike. It was uh, one of a kind in that small town. It was very expensive. Her dad had put the fear of death in me to never lose or damage Maggie's bike. And I always parked it in the same place when at the lower park, which was on one of the paint lines between two parking spots and the little parking lot. 
No one ever drove to that lot, so I wasn't being a total jerk. There was also probably about eight parking spaces in a straight line down there. When we turned to leave, there was two black-on-black -black SUVs parked tightly on either side of the bike, almost squeezing it in between. The windows were tinted to illegal limits, and all the other parking spots were on, were, were uh, excuse me, all the other parking spots were still available. Nobody had come out of the vehicles. It was threatening rain that day, so the park was almost uh, was mostly empty. I got a icky feeling about it, we'll say. Not wanting Maggie to go near those SUVs, but needing to get the bike, I came up with a plan quickly. I pointed out the bike to Maggie and explained it to be stuck, using her level of understanding, and the fact that we were good friends to my advantage. Oh no, the bike is stuck, but I tell you what, here's what we'll do. If you take my hand really tight, I'll grab the bike and we can both pull hard, okay? Hang on tight, don't let go, I told her. Creeping up to the bike apprehensively, grabbing the bike by the back tire. It was a heavy bike, so it actually balanced itself pretty well. Maggie accepted the assignment and took my arm with both hands, thinking this just to be a simple task of freeing the bike. Ugh, I hated being that close to the vehicles. I could feel whoever was inside watching us from the blacked out windows. It felt like it took forever to pull the bike free, but we got it and insisted that we took it uh, and I insisted that we take it across the little people only bridge. The, let me try, try that again, sorry. We got it and I insisted that we took it across the little people's only bridge and go back to her house that way so it was harder for them to follow. Again, I told her family about this and they still didn't seem to care. I told my family about this and they unsurprisingly also didn't care. I felt like I was going nuts, seeing such b a bizarre behavior and worrying they were after my disabled friend while everyone just shrugged it off. It was awful. Sightings of the sedan and SUVs would become very frequent, and I started carrying a large knife with us on day trips. Her dad didn't like that at all, but still didn't believe me. At that point, I was also mid-level in martial arts, so I was at least somewhat comfortable with the idea of decking someone if needed. Sightings started to decrease, sudden, sightings started to decrease suddenly, and I was starting to question if I'd made a big deal out of nothing after all when I left Maggie's house late one summer night, just after dark. At the time, I had a crappy white Oldsmobile and a few bad habits with it. I wasn't a great driver country kids never are, and working so close to home, I used to be bad at keeping gas in the tank, thinking, ah, I'll just throw some in tomorrow, no big deal. I started on my way home, what's usually about a 10 or so minute drive in the country. On the main road out of town, a black SUV is on my tail immediately. I try to tell myself it's a popular vehicle out here, every farmer has a black SUV, it's probably nothing. After all, I was solidly convinced they were after Maggie, not me. The road out of town is very straight, until the first intersection. Right before the first intersection, the other SUV was parked in the oncoming lane's shoulder. Once me and the other SUV pass, it turns on and pulls beside us. Or behind us, that is. In my head, I'm thinking, what the F? I put on my blinker for my normal turn, see two blinkers turn on behind me. I flip the blinker off and blow past the intersection. They follow suit. Now I know I'm being followed. I was young and admittedly reckless. Growing up in an abusive household makes one that way. It also makes it impossible to ask for help or know appropriate responses to things like this. I'll admit that what I did next was the wrong thing to do. I was young. I was just coming to terms with the idea that the people I thought were after Maggie are, for some reason, after me. This didn't feel real. I was in a car chase with a stupid 98 Oldsmobile Intrigue, a white one that stood out at night. I became reckless. My first thought was that I can't lead them to my home if they didn't know uh, where that was yet. Uh, after that, my next thought was the cop that used to sit on B to catch speeding teenagers rushing the valley. I gunned it towards B. I'm guessing that's Highway B. Uh, anyway, I gunned it towards B, hoping the cop was there, hoping to be pulled over, hoping I could tell him what had been following me or what had been happening, hoping he, he believed me. But there was no cop on B. No one was on B. I thought about going to a friend's house, but didn't know what the heck was following me. 
They stayed on my bumper at every speed, over every hill, around every turn. Eventually, I came to the realization that I couldn't run forever. My dumb butt hadn't put gas in for a while and I was running very low. Eventually, I'd run out and be stuck. Then what? I really pushed it and sped towards bump, uh, Bump's Bluff. There's a winding road there with some weird field access driveways scattered around. I got around the corner, slammed it in reverse, and plunged backwards into a cornfield. I turned off the car and hoped my glaring white vehicle didn't show in the dark. I hung out there until I was pretty sure I'd lost them. I never did see them drive by. I barely got home and told my family what had happened. Again, no one believed me, and I got a lecture on running the car out of gas. I got to work the next day and told Maggie's family about it. Same thing. No one believed me. Weird thing is, I never ever saw any of those people or cars ever again after that. It just stopped. Like a month and a half of stalking, ending in a car chase, and they just stopped? I don't get it. I don't know what they wanted from us or from me. And I don't know if this is related, but later that year, while I was at the gym, late, it was just me and some other dudes there. Older, a little sketchy, but younger than the guy in the sedan. I was getting ready to go and had to use the bathroom. I put my backpack on the bench by the door and my bottle of water inside the strap on my bag. I used the facilities and came back to find two identical water bottles inside the strap on my backpack. Same brand. Same amount missing. Same wear on the label. I stared at it a moment, trying to comprehend what was going on, when the other guy at the gym sidled up on me and asked what I was doing. This startled me, as he was standing too close and seemed eager for something. I took on an innocently confused look and said, Well, I had one water bottle and now I have two and don't know where the other one came from. To which he responded much too eagerly, Oh, looks like you got two now. Better drink them both. Yeah, that was it for me. I said, No. I don't think that's a good idea. I might catch someone's cold. I took both bottles to dump out at the faucet and tossed the empties into recycling. If looks could kill, I'd be dead. The look he gave me was ugly. I quit the gym after that. Even if you decide not to read this on your show, I'm just looking for answers. I'm so confused what happened to me. What was that? I still, get, I still get scared when I see black SUVs, and I still get anxious if I think someone's following me for too long. Any ideas, welcome. Thank you for reading through my story. Signed, Toby. Holy... Or, or Tori. Oh my gosh. What a story. Unbelievable. Wow. Uh, I used to be in school-age childcare for a while before I discovered uh, radio. Actually, before I discovered um, Pizza Hut, and then then uh, before that, and then discovered banking, and then discovered the credit union, and then discovered radio. Any, anyway, uh, I did it for uh, for a few years, and you know you have to go through some training to identify abuse and stuff like that. But uh, so when I'm around kids, I'm a little bit more observant, or at least I used to be. I'm not anymore, but I but I was back then, and. I remember seeing a kid that I, I thought was um, being abused, and I had I had to call it in. Just he, I, and I knew the kid's parents too, and um, they were they were nice people, but there was just something that was kind of off. So I had I had to call Child Protective Services, and turns out everything was fine. And I feel horrible about calling because they don't know that it was me that called, but still. Uh, you do what you you have to do it because you feel that there's something wrong. You feel that child, that particular child's in danger. Whether or not you have the evidence, you know, to prove it or not, if you suspect it, you really need to call somebody. So I'm glad that you were start look you started looking for that cop, but to find out later that they were actually after you, I think maybe that's the reason that it stopped. They were look they were going after you. And they may have noticed that you noticed them, but they probably didn't, but well, they, you didn't know that it was them. And maybe they actually kind of recognized that, that you weren't sure what was going on. So they still felt somewhat comfortable to stalk you like that. But once Maggie's gone and they're following you, 
and you go on that, that car chase, that puts them into a dangerous situation because now you know it's you that they're after. You know what they're driving, black SUVs, and all you have to do is call a cop somewhere and you know and and they could follow you or the cop you know could follow you or whatever but i think because they're dealing with an adult now or you know late teen whatever i think maybe the cover's blown you know that that's kind of what i'm thinking so the, at that point the cover's blown okay we screwed it up we didn't get her and so we're not going to get her and trying to go after her again at this point after that long chase after her disappearing and us not finding her because you were in the cornfield uh, you know, she's she she knows that we're out after her, so she's going to be on on guard all the time now. She's not worth the effort. That's what I'm thinking happened. But wow, so, so terrifying. I can't believe though that Maggie's parents didn't believe you and didn't care. I know your parents were horrible. You were abused as a child, and I'm very sorry to hear that. But you would think Maggie's parents, especially with Maggie being a special needs child, that they would take some precaution there. If Maggie was, you know, close to being a teenager, was cute, attractive, then yeah, I mean, you're, you're immediately thinking, oh great, the perverts are out there, they're going after Maggie. I would understand why they were thinking that it was, that you were thinking it was her they were going after, not you. But you said you were 19 years old, so you were young and attractive, too. So uh, I can understand why the SUVs were kind of going after you. Uh, I had a niece, ha I still have a niece, and she's still my niece, but she went to Mexico a few years ago. And uh, apparently that is a very dangerous place to go, especially if you are a, a teenager with blonde hair and you're attractive, because she came this close to being kidnapped in order to be 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 uh, sold in into the sex trade and she knows that because apparently uh when when they approached her and they ran off they they started to chase them but they got away they went to the to the authorities there and the authorities said yeah that's been happening around here so you have to be careful i mean granted that's mexico but no matter where you are you you need to you need to have your heads up. You need to need to have eyes on the back of your head, no matter where you're going. But especially as you were watching somebody else's child. I mean, you've got the double responsibility there, yourself and the child. Um, man, in, in today's world, it's just it is so ugly, isn't it? I really. I was watching a TV show the other day, and they were talking about how scientists think maybe they finally found the cure for aging that you could, well, you know, just as an example, what if you could take a pill and live forever? And, or, or stop aging and live forever, you know? And I don't know if I'd want to do that because this, this world just keeps see, keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So th this ugly stuff that's happening. Whew. You The way you wrote that, though, was extremely exciting, Tori. You might want to write that down. I mean, you've got it written right here. Maybe get a ghostwriter or something, because that would make a very interesting book. Or if nothing else, if not a book, maybe uh, you know a, a long novelette, something. Um, and just just come up with a with a decent ending for it. Wow! Th thank you very much, Tori. I appreciate it. It's going to be hard to top that story, even though there's nothing paranormal about it. It's still terrifying. All right, this next one comes from Laura. She says, In my younger years, I hung out with a group of people. Some were friends, some were something else. One in particular acted as though he were the leader. In reality, there was no leader. He always claimed there was something inside him that came out involuntarily. He also claimed he was a wizard of sorts. None of us really believed him. Then one evening, I was standing in his driveway, waiting for the others to show up. We were talking about his inner demon and how he didn't have the luxury of becoming angry because bad things would happen. I laughed at him and asked if he was going to turn all green and start throwing things. <laughs> exactly what I was thinking, Laura. Hulk smash! Uh, well, what happened next completely shocked me. It happened so quickly that I didn't even have time to think about it. Something came out of him. I don't know if it came out of the top of his head or from his lips, honestly. It growled was black and looked like a controlled cloud of smoke. I jumped back at least two feet, used some choice words, and told him, stay away from me, you're evil. 
He then laughed what sounded like a fake laugh and asked if I saw him. My response, what the hell was that? Then he proceeded to tell me, he likes you. This sounds completely fictionous, but I will never forget that day. Or, I'm sorry, it sounds completely fictitious, but I will never forget that day. I'm, I'm making up words here now. Another memory of this same guy, years later, my ex-husband and I were at a party. Nothing big, just a few people hanging out and eating. This guy was there and he showed up after us and I didn't know he was going to be there. I smoked in those days, but didn't drive. He offered me a ride to get a pack of cigarettes as my husband was off showing someone his car. The store was literally a block away, so I didn't see the harm. I accepted the ride. We went to the store. Then he wanted to stop and talk. I suggested we should just get back, but he insisted. I lit a cigarette and he stopped in a parking lot. I don't remember the conversation, but I do remember I gave him the time it would take for me to smoke a cigarette about 15 minutes. We got back to the party and everyone except two people were gone. My ex was asleep on the couch. I asked where everybody went and was told they all left and my ex was not happy. What do you mean? I asked. I was only gone a minute. He looked at me as though I was making a bad joke and said, you were gone for four hours with frustration in his voice. This is crazy. I've never had anything like this happen before. Jump ahead about 20 years. I'm looking up stuff on de on uh, demonology, and it says, similar to alien abduction, the presence of a demon can actually make you lose time. I find this incredibly interesting, a curious phenomenon. I wonder how often this happens and how often it goes unknown to the people it happens to. Love your podcast and love that a Christian such as yourself has this type of podcast. The last Christian church I attended they would not even hear of such things that are discussed here. Love the open-mindedness, keep up the awesome work and the awesome podcast, signed, Creepy Stuff Happens Everywhere. Uh, thank you, Creepy slash Laura. Um, that, what a friend. My first question, what happened during that four hours? I want to know. I, I'm Granted, you probably don't want to go back to this guy, but... If you were gone for four hours because he wanted to, quote-unquote, talk, what happened for four hours that you were gone? Did he take advantage of you? Was there some sort of ceremony that took place that you don't remember? What were his motivations for doing that? I'd want to know. He's, he's got it. There's got to be a reason for him doing that to you, especially because he was so insistent on pulling over to talk. Four hours. Wow. Um, yeah, I know about the alien abductions things. I'd never heard of demonology or demons doing that to you, but man, I, yeah, if they're taking, if they're taking over that now, there you go. Maybe you were temporarily possessed. Maybe you went out and did some things that you just don't remember doing. Maybe he needed somebody to help him do some things. Maybe not like a seance or you know, it, a ritual or anything. Maybe he needed a partner in something to go out and do something, something illegal or something. I don't know. But anyway, I, that, that was, that's my first question. That's the, that's the biggest question. What the heck did you do to me during that four hours? Um, the, the whole smoke thing reminds me so much of the demons in the Supernatural TV show. That's it. For just a moment there, I thought, started thinking, oh, okay, maybe this isn't a real one. You know, she's just taking stuff from television. But uh, I believe you. I believe you. Yeah. I'm, hopefully this guy is not in your life anymore anyway. And as for uh, the last Christian church you attended, so many of them don't want to talk about the paranormal. And I get that. I, I've attend, I attended those churches. And I, to, I understand why they don't want to cover this stuff. Because really, it's, it's just so odd and strange and it's hard to explain. And for the most part, uh, Jesus, uh, God, tells us to stay away from it. Um, I'm, I'm, t I'm bringing it from a, from a perspective of I'm not endorsing it. I'm just telling the stories. What, they, what God warns us about is being involved with it, going out and doing these things, which is why I, you'll never see me going out ghost hunting. You'll never see me going to parties, playing some of these games like Ouija or Charlie Charlie or, or uh, doing uh, spirit boards or and, um, you know, uh, light as a feather, like uh, anything like that. Uh, I, I won't do. I won't do the tarot cards. I won't go to fortune tellers. Anything like that. 
If you do, that you know, fine, that's 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 your thing, but I won't because my religion would not allow it. Plus, even if it did allow it, I don't want to open myself up to to a spiritual situation like that because you never know if it's going to be a good or a bad spirit coming in. So, so but that's probably why the churches don't because it's just it's so dangerous to play with. And it's really, there's a fine line there between talking about it and then being involved with it. So, and I sometimes wonder if I'm even crossing that line, like when I go to these uh, expos and conventions and stuff, because I'm stepping in to where a lot of these people are, and that's fine. We are supposed to, I mean, we're, we're supposed to, to love everybody, uh, but it's really hard to step into these things, have conversations with people and not want to get involved. Like... Like, ooh, you know what? Why don't you go ahead and just tell my, my, my fortune while I'm here? You know, you know just, just this one time. You know, I had somebody do an astrology chart for me once. And afterwards, I just thought, I started thinking to myself, why did I do that? Why did I allow that to be done? I mean, nothing bad happened, but still, it's like, I didn't need that. It didn't really tell me anything that I didn't know about myself. And it's sort of like a fortune telling kind of a thing. And I just didn't need it. It was just sort of a gut check type of thing. But, uh, yeah, and going to horror movies. All right, so am I just watching the stories, or am I getting suddenly now getting involved in those stories? It's a very fine line. I, I, I totally get it, and I think that's why some people have an issue with me being a born-again Christian doing a podcast like this. Uh, but until God tells me otherwise, I'm going to continue forward. And granted, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a little, little spiritual here, and I apologize, but... I think God's actually using weird darkness to reach people. Uh, we're talking about, you know, the hope in the darkness, you know, where, where we're helping people who have depression or other problems. We're getting the word out about that. Uh, weird darkness helps me to spread the word about the church of the undead, which is just a separate podcast, but every Sunday I'm doing like a Christian message over there. Um, but then again, you like hear stuff here, like when I'm doing chamber of comments or fireside frights, I get to share a little bit of my faith. And I've had people come to me saying, th well, just like yourself, thank you so much for doing something like this and being a Christian at the same time. And I've had people say they are now, after listening to the podcast, going back to church. They Or I've opened my Bible again for the first time and I was reading, you know, thank you so much for leading me back to it. So I think God's using the podcast. It's a very strange tool for, for God to be using. I Granted, I give you that. Uh, but I think he's using it and until such a time he stops using it or tells me to stop doing it. I'm just going to continue doing it. So thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the email. All right. Uh, Ella says a short one here. Uh, she says it was a darker night around nine o'clock when my little sister, mom and me went for a walk to look at the lightning about 10 miles away. Then I had that feeling I was being watched. I directed my flashlight near the bush. I saw a weird looking figure in the bushes hiding, watching us. As soon as he knew I saw him, he wasn't there. He ran away. He was covered in fur and had glowing eyes. I never walked that road at night again. I don't know where you were, Ella, uh, if you were in one of those roads that the Bray Road Beast is seen at, or maybe one of those areas where Bigfoot's seen, Chupacabra. I mean, what the way you described it, it could be so many tiny little things. You never know what it could be. Heck, it could have been Mothman, just just hiding well. I don't know, Ella. But uh, yeah, I, I don't blame you for going back down that, ro that road ever again, especially if it scared you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this next one comes from Sky, saying, From what I remember, I had a question for my mom. She had just come out of her room, and I was following her down the stairs. I was talking to her more than she was replying. Once we got to the bottom of the stairs, she told me to hold my thoughts while she went to the bathroom. So I said I'd wait. I sat down at the end of the stairway while she walked into the bathroom a few feet across from me. She turned on the light and closed the door. I waited for a couple of minutes before I heard the garage opening. I figured it was my father. Weirdly enough, it turned out to be my mother. I stood up right away and pointed to the bathroom. It was in sight, right next to me where my mother just walked in. I asked her how she did that. She looked at me, confused. I explained I was just talking to her, and she was supposed to be in the bathroom. She said she hadn't been home all day and just got home now. We opened the door. The light was still on. No one was in there. We never really talked about it again after that, but it stayed with me. I'll bet it did, Sky. A doppelganger story. 
Those are rare. How do you you can't explain those? And most of the doppelganger stories, you can't. There's there's no actual explanation for them, especially when you know that it's a family member you're talking to. Not like seeing somebody across the you know across the parking lot going, "Hey, I think that was my dad." You know, nothing like that. I mean, you're actually conversing with this person. You know, you know intimately this person, and for that to be a to be a doppelganger would just be freaky. Uh, thank you, Sky. I appreciate the email. The next one comes from uh, Arthur saying, Dear Sir, you, <laughs> you don't have to call me Sir. Please don't call me Sir. Anyway, uh, I've already had the opportunity to share my story with the public in my country uh, through a conspiracy magazine dedicated primarily to UFOs uh, last January. Nevertheless, the subject seemed important enough for me to share it with an international audience. I was therefore seeking to have a longer version of my story published in English. You have the last version of my testimony here attached. Uh, I mentioned inside several times the blog I first firstly tried to create. Actually, I must warn you, I have already been censored. My article has been deleted twice from Reddit, first on the grounds of non-compliance with Rule 6 and then on the grounds of spamming. After that, it was the blog I designed to share my testimony that was deleted without any explanation from the platform with my user account. To summarize the subject, I was led to become interested in a relatively well-known video game because of the strange links I discovered between it and a disturbing person with whom I had already had a PSI experience, or, or Psy experience, I guess. But by taking an interest in said game, I got the iconic character of the game interested in return. Indeed, I was seduced and threatened for almost two years by a thought form generated by the player's psychic investment in this character. She wanted me to become her companion and actually to help her find a way to become real. However, it became clear from my experience and especially from the research I did afterwards to understand these events that this was no accident. The game had been designed to elicit this phenomenon. Moreover, there are several elements that make me fear that the next step for the creators of the game is to create another entity of the same type in the near future. But this one seems to me to be much more worrying because it looks like an exterminating angel determined to slaughter as many people as possible. I hope that my text will be readable and even pleasant for you to read. Best regards, Arthur. Okay, this is going to be interesting. Never had this one happen before. How long is this? I'll bet it's going to be a really long... Oh, my gosh. Um, it's like 13 pages long. Uh, full of... Okay, it didn't come through very... You know what? Is this about Polybius? If this is about Polybius, I've actually done a story on it, but no. Okay, no. You were just mentioning that. Because this is this is anime stuff. Um, the deeper my desires, no reinforced. I tell you what, this is so long, uh, buddy. I, I'll I'll look at this a little bit later on and see if I can make sense of it. If if it really is uh, readable and usable, I'll probably have to make it an entirely separate podcast because this is so much stuff. Um, he call it's the game. He says it's D D L C. A truly cursed video game. So, all right. Well, if anybody knows what DDLC is, if you're familiar with the game, um, how about you just email me and tell me your experience? This is one of those too long, didn't read <laughs> stories. Um, I, I don't want to do that to him. I mean, I will go go back in and, and read it. But since you already have to, are telling me English is not your first language and that you had a hard time putting it together, it's probably going to be brutal for me to try and, and read aloud here for a Fireside Frights. So... I will look at it a little bit later on, but uh, if you are a weirdo listening right now, you've played DDLC, you know what this guy's talking about, if you've had any weird experiences with it, drop me an email, let me know. Uh, again, Darren at WeirdDarkness.com, Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N, and in the uh, in the subject line, just put DDLC, and that way we'll, we'll know. Okay, uh, moving on. All right, this one comes from DJ. Let me start out with saying I have a few stories from my childhood to my adult life. I'd like to just use the name DJ or JD. This thing I encountered 
was about 14 years ago when I was staying with my girlfriend at the time, which is now my significant other. We were staying in a camper on our parents' land near her mother's house. I've worked in the oil field for years at this time and travel a lot for work. I'd flown back home in from Colorado and decided to go to bed around 9 or 10 p.m. Normal oil field workers back then had weird working schedules, so normally you had to call in and see what yard time was around 5 or 6 p.m. and plan to get up anywhere from midnight to 2 a.m. in the morning. I'd come in and called to check yard time, which was around 2 a.m. I told the girlfriend I was going to bed so I could get up and lay down in the bed. I assumed she came to bed around 9 or so that night after spending some time with her daughter and putting dinner up. I didn't rest well and kept looking at the clock to see what time it was to make sure I wasn't going to be late. I'd say around 10.30, 11, I heard my dog outside going nuts and heard the, dog, uh, heard the door open to the camper. I didn't think anything of it because the children would come over to see if their mom is, uh, see if there's, oh, excuse me, to see their mom if something happened from her mother's house, which was across the way. I looked at the clock and realized that neither child had said anything when I heard the door close. I then realized that my feet felt a little heavy, and I just put it off as being jet lagged. I laid there for about another 15 minutes and realized that the pressure I had felt on my feet had moved up to my knees. Oh, I can already see where this is going, DJ. Sleep paralysis, right? All right, let's see. Now I know most of your listeners are going to say, oh, there it is right there. Oh, it has to be another sleep paralysis case. Well, listen to the rest of the story. I'll swear to God this was not something that could be explained by those stories everybody talks about. Okay, uh, so I'm being told I'm wrong already. All right, we'll see how it goes. Another 15 to 30 minutes passed, and the pressure had moved up to my waist. At this time, I was so freaking upset that I had come up with the idea of just rolling over. Just rolling over would allow me to get this thing off of me and I could get back to sleep. This is where it got weird. I imagined, and I do mean imagined, cocking my hip to the left and rolling over on my side. I imagined me rolling over and my right side landing on the nightstand. This is when I realized I could actually move my fingers. I started moving my fingers and realized the feeling I was feeling was actually the blanket on the bed, not the wood of the nightstand. At this point, I was so ticked off, I tried to do the same thing. I felt my hip actually move, and this thing shoved its hands on my chest and yelled in my face. I couldn't hear her scream, but say her face, saw her face screaming at me like a strobe light. Once this happened, I could move my arms and put my hand on its chest, threw it against the wall, heard it hit and run through the house. I curled up next to my significant other like a little child and curled up in the fetal position. I could hear it walk back through the camper to the bed and felt it push down on the edge of the bed. I kicked it every time I felt the pressure on the bed for about an hour, and then I heard the door open. Dogs went crazy, and then nothing. I stayed in the fetal position, holding on to my significant other until the alarms went off to go to work. When I got up and got ready for work, she got up to make coffee and some breakfast. I didn't say a word on what happened. I went to work and told some of the Hispanic guys about it, and they told me it was death, reminding me I was still within its grasp. After work, I made it back out to her place and sat down to relax on the couch before having to go to bed again for the next day. While I was sitting there, her daughter came in and said, Mom, a woman came into my room at Nanny's house last night. I asked her if she liked dolls too, and she just screamed at me, but I couldn't hear her screaming. I just froze on the couch and waited for her daughter to go back to her mother's house. I then asked her if anything strange happened last night when she came to bed. She said she had put her leg across mine when she went to bed and I threw her leg off me last night. I then told her what happened the night before. I believe we stayed there another year in that camper and I would not sleep in that bed from then on. I told my significant other then that I would sleep on the couch to make sure that I could watch the door for anything that wanted to come in the house while I was there. You can use the story if you wish. I've been listening to your podcast since I found it about five or six years ago. Lots of travel and I was tired of music, so I chose your webcast to use while driving. I do have more stories, military, childhood, and just things I can't explain. I may share some in the future, and if you ever make it down toward Texas, I'll try to make a road trip plan uh, if you have... Um, plan you have if I, oh if okay 
make a road trip uh, plan if, if he's off if you're off of work. Keep it weird. Keep us entertained. I appreciate the break from the crazy world we live with your crazy with your creepy pastas and things from the past. DJ. Oh, sorry. Sounds that a weirdo that believes in Christ. DJ. So so you're a weirdo in Christ, as we like to say. Thank you very much, DJ. I appreciate that. Oh, OK. Uh, I'm still going to say sleep paralysis in the beginning, but yours is definitely different. Um, I think the demon used sleep paralysis as its entryway to get to you. But well, I don't recall sleep paralysis is you usually does have that physical feeling. So you feel that there's something on top of you. Um, I don't remember anybody hearing uh, hearing scream or, or seeing seeing something screaming at them, but not hearing it. Uh, I don't think I don't remember any sounds being associated with with uh, sleep paralysis. I'm convinced that there is a demonic aspect to it because of my own experience with sleep paralysis. But yours is so different because you were able to push it off of you once you once you got out of the paralysis. You were able to push it off of you, and it hit the wall. And then you heard it, heard it uh, running around the house as you ran to your girlfriend's room. So uh, that's why I'm thinking it started off as sleep paralysis, but it used sleep paralysis kind of as a gateway or an entryway into our world. Especially since the daughter kind of hurt, kind of saw the the thing too. That's that's freaky, man. man. I don't know if the camper is haunted or if there's something that's happening happen, that it happened to you and your your uh, significant other or what but oh my gosh that would be, I would definitely if, if I was still at the camper I would I would definitely be calling a priest oh my gosh All right. hey thank you very much DJ I appreciate the uh, I, I appreciate the email all right let's see here uh, this next one comes from uh, Jack all right Hi, Darren. I just finished an episode of Fireside Frights where you asked people to submit stories of dreams that felt so real you can't believe they weren't when you wake up. So here's mine from about five years ago. I remember it vividly. I dreamt about being on a date with a girl named Kiera. I'd been with her for years, and this was our weekly outing. A nice romantic meal. We walked and talked along the beach afterwards for hours. I remember just being so full of joy, watching her blonde hair flow in the ocean breeze. We headed back into town from there and met up with some friends who commented on how happy we were. Well, about here is when I woke up next to my now girlfriend or now ex-girlfriend. I laid there, staring at her, wondering who she was and why she was in my bed. It took about 30 minutes for reality to set in and for me to remember my real girlfriend's name. Once it all clicked, I was distraught at the loss of Kiera, who I considered to be the, lo the love of my life. Discovering she didn't exist was mortifying. That's my reality dream, and I still get a bit saddened by it when I think of it. Oh, and I never told my ex that I briefly forgot her name, and no, that's not why we broke up. <laughs> Thanks for the podcast, Darren. I listen nearly every day and work, signed Jack. That, that was going to be my question. You know, Did you break up shortly after this because you didn't remember her name, or maybe because you told her the dream, you know? But no, you said you never did tell her the well, you never told her that you forgot her name. I don't know if you told her about the dream or not, because that would be hard. That would be so hard. So, some dreams are so realistic. And if you actually did find the love of your life in a dream and it felt so, I mean, it felt completely real to you. And then you wake up and it's gone. That would be devastating. Um, cause, cause that, you would you would just know in your heart that person exists. She has to exist. You you even knew her name, Kiera. You you knew exactly what she looked like, what she smelled like, what she felt like, and then to wake up and to find out that she doesn't even exist would just that would be heartbreaking, man. I'm I'm sorry that you had to have that dream because I know it's probably haunting you to this day. I don't know if you're if you got a girlfriend or if you're married now or what, but that would see it would be tough for me to move on at that point. I mean, not only would we would I break up the, with the girl because suddenly I would be in love with somebody else, Kiera in this case. Uh, she may not exist, but I'm still in love with somebody else. And I would be constantly on the look for her. Nobody would nobody would would measure up. I would go the rest of my life wondering, does Kiera truly exist? Is this is this my way of knowing that I should wait for my 
literal dream girl to to show up in my life. That was wow, that would be hard. Oh man. I've had realistic dreams with uh, you know, ex-girlfriends in my dream or or stuff like that. I, th I think I maybe mentioned once before that I had a dream that I had a son, um, tiny little redhead boy, maybe about two or three years old, playing in the backyard. And it was a, it was a short dream, but it was so realistic. I woke up and I actually cried when I realized that I was not a dad. Um, and and I still kind of th I still think back on that. And that was goodness gracious. I mean that that was I think it was even before Robin and I met. That I had that dream, or shortly, or shortly after. So I mean, it would have been maybe close to thirty years ago. Still, I can think of that dream and remember that kid's face. So, yeah, it's hard. Uh, thanks again for the email, Jack. This next one comes from. Uh, let's see here. From Randolph. All right. Uh, hey there, Darren. I recently began listening to your podcast while on extended drives and felt inclined to share a story I don't often tell. Thank you for all that you do. I'm an LCSW, working both with children and adults in need. I live in San Antonio, and though at the time the story occurs, I worked with a larger therapy group, I presently work privately. Even back when I worked in the larger firm, I've always preferred to work with individuals living in the south and east parts of town as often these areas are populated by those who are in the most need. Though I work with individuals who suffered greatly from trauma related to gang violence, abuse, and addiction, I have never been harmed in any way by the clients I've worked with, although I have had some odd encounters, with the one I'm telling you right now being one of the strangest. The clients were two adult women living on the south side. They shared a small home, likely built in the 50s, and were both in their early 30s, they grown up together, though they were not related, and they both had experienced a great deal of trauma at the hands of abusers, both when they were children and when they were adolescents. Their troubled history included former gang involvement, each one sporting the, tel the uh, telltale tattoos of the gangs operating in the area, and they presented themselves as very tough ladies. They both had PTSD, depression, and were struggling with the symptoms. I graduated with my master's only a year before, being 25 at the time of me seeing them and immediately recognizing that something else was going on with these two when I entered their home. I held in I held in-home sessions as usual with them, meeting once weekly to perform case management, provide coping skills, and begin providing therapy. They were very open with me, and I remember them saying repeatedly that they felt that I was a good person or that I had a good vibe which they could sense. I was happy with this, but then things began to become strange. I recall a time when I was visiting them while a storm was about to pass through the city. We discussed how it would be dangerous for me to travel back to my home through the storm, and one of them produced a vial with a gray, ashy powder inside. She rapidly took the powder and spread it onto me, my reaction being, unfortunately, to just sit there and allow the substance to be placed on me. They then both assured me that my ride home would be safe due to them having protected me. I wanted to be respectful of their beliefs, and so I thanked them. On the ride home, in the blinding rain, I narrowly avoided a deadly crash between two cars ahead of me. I was spared not due to my own driving prowess, but instead due to the peculiar way the cars seemed to part just enough for me to squeeze through without a scratch. I had honestly forgotten about the whole protection spell my two clients had cast upon me, but I was reminded of it when I received a call from one of the women who was checking in on me when I'd returned home. Not being a religious person, I kept a skeptical outlook on the events, figuring it was a wild coincidence. I then began noticing other things, however. During a mindfulness breathing exercise with the two women, I felt the room go cold and heard voices. I maintained a calm demeanor on the outside, but internally I was panicking and wondered if I should find myself my own psychiatrist until the two women spoke up and asked me if I had heard and felt the presence in the room. I was flushed with an ambivalent feeling of both relief and fear. I was relieved to know that I was not hallucinating alone, however, I was afraid of the implication that there was some presence and I had actually felt it. The two of them then began doing some ritual. I completely lost control of my session at this point, mind you, 
They lit candles and made some kind of smoke, reciting some ritualistic phrases. I did my best to stay calm. When it was over, I admit that I felt safe, calm, and secure. They teased me, saying that they had done a session on me, and then I reminded them of the things I wanted them to work on for the next week, and left. I convinced myself that what I'd witnessed was some kind of trick. Perhaps I had interpreted the echoes of people passing by outside as the voices, and there had been a strange draft. I couldn't lie to myself about the last thing I witnessed, though. If you remember, I had earlier stated that the two women had troubled pasts. They'd shared with me some of the crimes they'd committed, and we discussed the grief and trauma which accompanied these revelations. Many of the crimes were rather violent, and they made it clear that they still had individuals in their lives that they greatly disliked. One was a former SAPD officer who had wronged them. They each had an intense hatred for her. But we discussed anger, its sources, and the need to let go of such feelings. They maintained their hatred for this woman, even showing me a picture of her face with an X marked through it. Since they never stated a desire to physically harm this woman, only an intense hatred of what she had done to them, I was not overtly concerned with anyone's safety. I was more focused on helping them let go of that anger. On one of the last days I met with the two women, I had come for their session, and they let me know that they needed to run to the grocery store to pick up a few items and that they'd be back. Though it seemed inappropriate, they trusted me, and so I allowed them to leave in their home to wait. All right, so you're waiting in their home as they take off. Okay. While sitting there, I heard a strange and out-of-place noise. It was a tapping like that on a window, though it seemed to be coming from one of their bedrooms. I eventually gave in to the urge to investigate and went into the room. I had never really been inside of this room. Occasionally, we would meet in the other woman's room, but never hers. As I walked inside, I immediately found the source of the tapping, but took a while to comprehend and process what I was looking at. On the dresser, there was a mason jar with the shrunken woman inside of it. The woman was banging on the inside of the glass and when she saw me began yelling for help. My mind raced to explain what I was looking at. I couldn't. Horrified, I began to inch closer to the dresser with the jar on top as if I wasn't even in control of my legs. As I got closer, I recognized the woman as the former officer in the photo I'd been shown. I feel like at this moment I, disassoci or I dissociated from the reality of the situation. I pretended as if I was watching a movie of myself interacting with this insane, shrunken person in a jar. I think because I couldn't otherwise handle what I was witnessing. She pleaded with me to let her out. She told me that the two women had shrunken her and that she'd been there for about three days. She told me that they'd been tormenting her, playing cruel games with her as their captive while they put her in a taco, pretending they would eat her, forced her to clean their dishes ten times her size, even squashed her between their panzas once for calling them fat. I stood there unable to even let out a squeak for what felt like an eternity. Then I heard their car door slam. Like lightning, I bolted from the room, closed the door, and sat back down on the couch. I could still hear the tapping. When the two women entered, I lied about having a family emergency and went home. I then had three more sessions with the two women, decided to hold them at the group office instead of in-home, and discharged them from and uh, discharged them from my caseload. I still think about what I saw often. I especially am reminded when it rains, the thunder reminding me of the storm and the tapping of the raindrops on my window reminding me of the woman in the jar. I don't know what those women were, if they were witches practicing Brigeria, Santeria, or what. What often troubles me is how nice they were to me. They loved me. They cried when I terminated our sessions. I struggle with what I saw. It felt so real. I know it was real. Did I doom that woman to her fate by not intervening? Even if I did intervene, though, what would have happened to me? I've never been witness to anything else supernatural while providing counseling, but a fear still lives inside of me because of that encounter. That's a new one. The, oh, I had no idea that was coming. This is one of those stories that if I had read it online 
and it wasn't sent to me by a weirdo family member, I probably wouldn't believe it. It's it, it sounds like one of like 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 a creepy pasta, you know. I'm not saying that I don't believe it. I'm just saying this is something. Well, because creepy pastas usually somebody will use a fake name or whatever. But I can see this person is using their real name with me because I'm looking at their email address and it actually has their entire their na name in the email address. So I'm guessing it really is a real person here. Oh. The, the ashes or whatever they spread on you at the beginning, I thought, okay, yeah, all right. So, yeah, they're, they're into some sort of witchcraft, paganism, something along those lines. I, I could see that. Um, and, yeah, it, it was maybe maybe a uh, you know, coincidence that you, that you weren't in the wreck. I could see all of that. Once they started, oh, man, I don't know. Oh, <laughs> you try to get them past the anger, and once you, once you see that that photo with the X through it, I, you almost feel like you need to call somebody. But you're right; they haven't actually they haven't actually threatened anybody. So if if it's a, if it's a doctor patient uh, um, confidentiality thing, I don't think you could have said anything to anybody unless they actually did threaten to hurt someone. And they didn't. They just showed you that picture with an X through it. But yeah, how do you how do you go on after seeing something like this? You, I my my first thing is well, you call somebody, you tell somebody what you just saw. There's no way they're going to believe you. There's no way. This is all right. Now I understand what people who see UFOs and stuff like that why they don't want to tell people. Because they don't want people to think, to think of them as odd or weird or strange or whatever. All right. Now, in, in Randolph's case here, that's exactly what would happen to me. I would not know what to think. I might go to a demonologist or somebody. Somebody who has some experience with the paranormal and maybe ask them, do you know anything about this? Have you heard of anything that's happened like this before? And just kind of get it, try to get a gauge of what it was that I just went through. Uh, but I mean, you can't. How do you turn? You couldn't turn them in. It's not like you can call nine one one and say, uh, "Yeah, yeah." There's these two witches, and they've they've shrunk this little lady and are keeping her in a jar. The nine one one people are going to immediately think you're a crank and probably send cops over to arrest you for wasting their time. Wow, Randall, or uh, Randolph, that is. <laughs> oh man. It, it, it almost sounds like a Twilight Zone episode, dude. That, that is really creepy stuff. Th thank you very much for sending it to me. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this next one comes from Mike. He says, big fan of Weird Darkness and you. My family has a story about a neighbor that I thought would be interesting. Keep up the good work. Signed, Mike. All right. And he calls his story The Old House. In the late 1960s, my family bought a house in northern New Jersey. It was the newest house in the neighborhood. The rest of the neighborhood had houses built between the 1920s and early 1960s. The area used to be farmland with a scattering of houses until the George Washington Bridge was completed. Then it slowly turned into a commuter neighborhood for people working in New York City. By the 1960s, all the farmland was gone and every previous open lot had a house on it. One of the older houses was owned by Ida. Ida, as the majority of the neighborhood, uh, were either immigrants, immigrants or the first generation born in the United States. Oh, okay. So, I, all right, for a second there, I thought she was, he was talking about like the entire family, but no, he is talking about an individual. Ida, as the majority of the neighborhood, uh, either immigrants or the first generation born in the United States, my perspective as a kid growing up was that Ida was a mean and nasty woman. A little background on Ida. She was born around 1900 in Germany. She was born out of wedlock and was a teenager during World War I. She immigrated to the U.S. in the 1930s, married another German immigrant, and settled in New Jersey. They never had kids, all their relatives lived in Germany, and around 1970 her husband died and she broke a hip. The hip never healed properly, she'd get around using metal crutches. Ida was a loud and boisterous woman who let everybody know her opinions. Ida would yell at us when we rode our big wheels and bicycles on the sidewalk in front of her house. 
She stated we were damaging her sidewalk. She called the police on a neighbor because leaves from his tree were supposedly blowing into her yard. <laughs> wow, she is a meanie. You're right, Mike. Everybody had trees in the neighborhood, including Ida. She yelled at people parking in front of her house because she wanted a space available in case anyone came to visit her. Nobody ever did, and she did not own a car. She was extremely religious and believed that she was a conduit directly to God. Oh, man, one of those people. Okay. She didn't think she was a prophet, but instead believed her opinions were sent and approved by God directly to let the sinners know that God was thinking about or what God was thinking about them. The God who agreed with her was definitely from the Old Testament. The divorced neighbor moved his girlfriend into a house next door to Ida. Ida would call a girl, the girlfriend a whore because they were not married and living in sin. This happened every time they were in proximity around each other. It wasn't a snide remark under Ida's breath. It was a loud yell that the entire block would hear. I gave the lady a lot of credit. She completely ignored Ida. This occurred for 15 years. Before going on with Mike's email, why is it that the woman is called the whore but not the guy? Why is that? I mean, the guy is just as guilty as the woman for living in sin, as she says. So, it's, it's amazing the double standard that we have. Guys can, can sleep with as many girls as they want. We think that they're studs, but a girl, a girl stays with one guy, sleeps with him, and stay, lives with him out of marriage. Suddenly, she's a whore. I, I just don't get that. All right, anyway, moving on. Uh, another neighbor's daughter became a teenage mom. Ida called her a whore when she came home from the hospital. Ida found out the newborn's uh, name was Rebecca. She yelled at the family that baby Rebecca was going to grow up to become a deceiver like the mother of Esau and Jacob in the Bible. The worst memory I remember is that an older kid in the neighborhood was hit and killed by a car. Another child was born into the family about 18 months later. Ida stated that the family only had that child to replace their dead child. Even as a young kid, I knew that was messed up. Another personality quirk of Ida was that she was a strong supporter of Germany during World War II. Wow! Okay. She was a young woman going through the trials and tribulations of Germany during World War I and in the, in the 1920s. She was very proud of how Hitler had uplifted Germany and the German people in the 1930s. Okay. I never heard her say anything directly anti-Semitic, but she would reiterate that Hitler was right and that Germany should have won the war. That alienated every World War II vet and their families in the neighborhood. Yeah, you don't live in the U.S. and say that Hitler was a great guy. You just, <laughs> I don't care if you're from Germany, that you just don't do that. Uh, the reason I know so much about Ida is that my mother was the only person in the neighborhood who befriended her. When I was around eight, my mother started buying groceries for Ida when she went shopping and would invite Ida over for coffee. Well, your mom was a special lady, Mike, that's all I can say. Ida would be spouting off her history and opinions whenever she was over at our house. I was just a kid playing around and her voice would be background noise. My father despised Ida and she had to be out of the house before he came home from work. When I was a little older, I asked my mom why she had a relationship with Ida, especially since both my parents were little kids in Nazi-occupied Eastern Europe during the war. Both of my parents were very lucky to have survived. My mom stated that Ida had no one in the world to help her, and with her disability, she could not survive. I asked about all the mean things she would say, and my mom stated that she does have hate in her heart, but that was based on her hardships that she had lived through. The hate just grew and grew inside Ida. Still, Ida still needed help. My mom, uh, ever the optimist, always saw the goodness in people. <clears throat> yeah, your mom was a saint, man. The routine went on for several years, but eventually Ida burned her relationship with my mom. Ida saw something she thought was inappropriate that my teenage sister did and went off all nasty on my sister. My mom had had enough. She told Ida to leave and not come back. My mom did continue to pick up her groceries, but Ida never, uh, never set foot in our house again. In 1991, my mother found Ida collapsed on the floor of her house when she was bringing her some groceries. Ida was rushed to the hospital but died shortly thereafter. It was of natural causes. Ida's lawyer found some distant relatives in Germany for her estate. The relatives wanted to just sell the house quickly and as is condition with as little expenses as possible. 
The house was 60 years old, with absolutely no upgrades and very, uh, very little maintenance for at least the previous 20 years. The lawyer offered the house to my parents for a very good price. My parents bought it. My parents did the minimum amount of work to update the house to make it livable. The house was not perfect, but it would be comfortable and clean for anybody who wanted to rent it. Okay, so they bought the house not for you to live in, but to... All right, okay, good. I was thinking, man, I would not want to move into this woman's house. All right, anyway, uh, their first renter was a young man who was working on an advanced business degree from Columbia University. The man came from a prominent and wealthy family in Korea. His father wanted him to get as much formal education as possible before letting his son into the family business. The reason I mention the background of the renter is that he had one goal, get his degree as soon as possible and go back to Korea to become involved in the family business. The renter did not party, use drugs, or even have a social life. He was a very focused young man. About a week after moving in, he started hearing footsteps on the wooden floors throughout the house every night. He checked all around the house to include the attic crawl space and basement every time he heard the footsteps. Nothing was ever found. All the deadbolts on the doors were locked, and all the windows were secure. The renter talked to my parents about it. My parents thought maybe some raccoons got into the house. They called an exterminator. No raccoons or traces of any other critters were found. About a week later, the renter was sleeping in the middle of the night. He was awakened by the sound of multiple windows being smashed. He locked himself in the bedroom and called the police. Multiple police officers arrived and surrounded the house. They told the renter through the 911 operator to stay inside while they secured the perimeter. Once the perimeter was secured, they had the, uh, the uh, renter turn on his bedroom light, open the window, announce himself to the police, and come out of his ground floor bedroom window. This was done in case there was somebody inside the house waiting to ambush the renter. The renter gave the door keys to the police, multiple police officers did a thorough search on every inch of that house, no one was found. In addition, none of the windows were broken and all the doors were secure. There was no sign of an intruder or anything being out of place. The police left. My mom, a night owl, saw the police cars arrive and leave. She walked over to the house and asked the renter if he was okay. The renter explained what had happened. He was distraught and extremely embarrassed. Approximately one week later, the same thing happened. The renter was awakened from a dead sleep to windows being smashed. The renter again called the police. The same officers arrived. Again, no signs of broken windows, kicked in doors, or anything being out of place. My mom was up and saw the commotion. She walked over to check on the renter. Most of the cops had left except the supervisor. The police supervisor was getting angry at the renter and explaining that they did not have the resources to deal with imaginary or prank 911 calls. The police supervisor stated the renter would be arrested the next time he called for this issue. My mom went into the house with the disheveled renter to make sure that he was all right. The renter excused himself for a few, mo for a few moments to change. My mom strongly believed this was Ida causing all the issues. My mom said the Lord's Prayer and whispered to Ida that Renter was a good man and for Ida to leave him alone. My mom then stated to Ida that her suffering in this world had come to an end, move on and be happy, Ida. Nothing weird ever happened after that night. The Renter received his degree and went back to Korea. Multiple Renters over the years never had an issue. The house was eventually sold and the new owners knocked it down to build a modern, ho uh, to build a modern house. I look back at Ida now as a man in his late 50s. Everybody goes through trials and tribulations in their life. Some experience life worse than others, but you can't have the bitterness and anger destroy you as it did Ida. I strongly believe that my mother's compassion brought a little happiness to the bitter person that was Ida while she was alive. I also believe that the compassion brought Ida peace after she had died. Oh my, what a great story, man. Your mother, is, well, incredible. I don't know if she's still alive or not, but Mother's Day needs something special for your mom. What a woman. And yeah, can you imagine being haunted by Ida? That's a, that is a ghost you do not want to deal with. <laughs> I feel so bad for that Korean guy. 
The poor kid. Oh, man. Okay, this next one uh, comes from Diane. She says, uh, Hi, Darren. This is my second true story submission to you. Well, thank you for sending in another one, Diana. I appreciate that. Uh, it was exciting to hear you read my first one. I especially enjoyed listening to your honest reactions and insights after reading each story. Your reactions are funny, honest, and very reasonable. This experience happened over 10 years ago when my husband and I made a trip to Las Vegas. We made a, a, a reservation to stay at a newer boutique hotel off the Las Vegas Strip for one night. Since the hotel we planned to stay at for the bulk of the trip was not available for the first night we arrived. When we tried to check in, the front desk employee informed us that the hotel was having plumbing issues. They gave us a refund and provided us with vouchers to stay at an older Marriott hotel off the main strip. We were disappointed but figured it was no big deal since it was free and only for a night. When we first saw our hotel room, we were not impressed. It was very basic, small, and outdated. The furniture was old and bulky, probably from the 80s or 90s, and the room did not fit much more than a king-size bed, two nightstands, and a TV. The room appeared dark, and I had an uneasy feeling about entering the room. I shrugged off that anxious feeling, thinking I was creeped out because the room was older than what I was accustomed to. We each showered and got settled for the night. The whole time we stayed in that room, I felt a nervous, heart-pounding sensation. It was an uneasy feeling, yet there was no immediate sense of fear or danger. I simply did not feel comfortable. I did not share how I felt with my husband that night because I figured it was probably nothing. The next day, we checked out of the hotel and proceeded to move on to other hotel to, uh, to our other hotel on the Las Vegas Strip. After we left that old creepy room at the Marriott Hotel, my husband told me he had a weird and vivid dream there. In the dream, he walked into the hotel bathroom of the room in which we were staying and saw a naked old man in a fetal position in the corner. My husband explained that he, surprisingly, did not feel scared of the old man. In fact, the old man seemed to be more afraid of my husband and was shrinking away as if he was trying to retreat from him in fear. After hearing this, I shared how I had felt weird in that room the whole time we stayed there, and my husband said he'd felt the same. After comparing our stories and thinking it over, we now believe we stayed in the same hotel room where that elderly man had passed away. He must have died in the bathroom. I jokingly told my husband he was the lucky one because the old man chose to show himself to him in the dream while I only felt his presence. Maybe the old man was more comfortable appearing to males? That experience made me realize that the tingly, uncomfortable, heart-pounding feeling I had could actually be a real thing. Maybe this is what others mean when they report being watched in a paranormal situation. I haven't had that feeling in other hotel rooms since then, hope I never do, but I guess I can now distinguish what that eerie feeling means. Thanks, Darren. I appreciate how you bring us a little light at the end of each show. It provides listeners with a beautiful and uplifting closure to balance out the strange and sometimes dark encounters that can happen in the world. Diane. Diane, great one. Yeah, uh, I uh, I think I I think in my last Chamber of Comments episode, I was talking about how some people uh, get the the spiritual gift of discerning of spirits, and I have to wonder if maybe that's kind of where you know where you guys were coming from. But well, no, no, I take it back. No, no, because you were both doing it at the same time, and you you probably don't have the same same spiritual gift. You might, but I, you know, that I was I was trying to rationalize it a little too soon there. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm glad it was only the one night, though. I've been in really old hotels that have kind of creeped me out, but I don't think it's for the same reasons. I think it's just because, like you mentioned, it was in a place that just, it wasn't, it didn't have the accommodations and it wasn't as updated as you were used to. And so it just kind of, it can make, make you feel a little out of place. Uh, I remember doing that. Uh, I was, I think I was taking an acting class or something in Chicago and decided to stay downtown went to one of the old hotels there and uh and it was it was an old old room it didn't have air conditioning or anything like that it barely had plumbing um it had electricity but really old switches that you had to turn rather than flip up and down it, it felt like it would have been haunted and i actually felt kind of creepy in that room probably no reason for it other than just my own imagination playing tricks on me but yeah um thank you very much for that i appreciate it uh, let's see here. This next one comes from uh, Kimberly. She says, hi, Darren. Um, 
just call me Kim. I'm writing you from the state of Delaware, or more affectionately known as Delaware. <laughs> as you know, we're a small state, and it doesn't seem that there's much in the way of paranormal going on around here as compared to more densely populated or larger geographical areas. Thus, I do get excited when I hear a fellow Delawarean telling his or her their, their story on a podcast. So I decided to share my story, which I've already sent to you for your next Fireside Frights in hopes that others from Delaware will hear it and be encouraged to send in their own. I had mentioned it really is not scary and that it'd be appropriate for a Christmas Fireside Frights. If you don't use it, it's no problem. I still love to share it with others as I feel it is a story of affirmation. I'm writing to you today because I recently heard a story regarding aliens and the possibility that our God, as we know him, may actually be of an alien race. I don't know that it was stated as such, but the story alluded to it nonetheless. I do often wonder how you feel about all the paranormal stories you share, specifically in regard to the spirits of those who were once alive. You've clearly stated many times that you take the Bible and its stories at their word, so you believe our souls go on and do not linger. This is a very broad statement, of course, as I don't recall your exact words, but you know what I mean. I love that you are a devout Christian, but a lover of the things that go bump in the night. There are many Christians who believe it is blasphemous to believe in such things, but I feel that part of being a good Christian is having an open mind and also respecting what others believe, regardless of our own beliefs. It's a matter of agreeing to disagree, I guess. Just a little backstory about me to give you some context before I get to the meat of my email. I was raised by two loving parents. My mom is a devout Christian and attended a Methodist church regularly. I went to church and to Sunday school for many years, but I found the church services to be very dry and boring. I believe today they're known as traditional services, whereas now we have contemporary services with live music and everyone wearing their good Sunday jeans, lol. Now that's my kind of church service. Had I been brought up in that era, I think I would still be attending church today. But I'm not a religious person. I'm what I like to call spiritual. I believe in God and Jesus Christ. I believe, actually, I know that God exists, and I have very strong faith in Him. I believe in the power of prayer, and I also believe that sometimes those unanswered prayers are truly a blessing to be revealed at a later time. Garth Brooks' song, Unanswered Prayers, is a perfect example of this. All right, before I go on, yes, that that uh, I worked in country radio for a short while, and that sh that song is just so so on the nose. Sometimes those it's 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 not really it's not spiritually accurate because God does answer all prayers. It's just sometimes the answer is no, or sometimes the answer is not now. But yeah, the whole idea of God saying no to prayers, which Garth calls unanswered prayers, sometimes that is the best answer to a prayer. Uh, obviously, okay. Anyway, moving on. So I have my religious mom, and now here's my dad. He grew up poor, was raised on a farm, and quit school sometime around the seventh grade to work the farm. When he married my mom, he worked full-time, and later, when he was almost 40, he opened a liquor store with his best friend, only three days after I was born, but continued to work both jobs for several more years. Wow. Uh, long story short, he never went to church because he was usually working. Dad didn't really talk about God, and I honestly don't know if he truly believed in him or not. He didn't believe in ghosts or anything of the sort, either. He was quite the quiet skeptic. Dad sold the store and retired at the age of 84, and he died one year later after having a fairly simple shoulder surgery. The story that I sent you for a Fireside Frights is centered around him, so I'll leave it at that. Um, before I continue on, uh, Kim, I don't know if I've, see if I've seen that story from you. So if you want to resend that story, you said it was great for Christmas, Send it to me and maybe in the subject line put Christmas Fireside or something along those lines so I'll know. That way I can set it off to the side because I don't remember seeing that. I may have already shared it and I just don't remember. If I have shared it, that's fine. But if I've not, if, if you haven't heard it, go ahead and send it my way again. I'd appreciate that. Okay, moving on. So Kim says, so here I am, a true believer in God, a belief instilled in me by my mother who is now 93 and still attends church in her retirement community when she's able. Then there's my skeptical side, which obviously came from Daddy. You see, I don't necessarily believe everything written in the Bible. I'm sure you will disagree with this, and I totally respect your beliefs. This letter is just to share my thoughts and a bit of a different take on who God may be. The Bible was physically written by man, and we all know that man, aka the human race, is flawed. There are so many conspiracy theories surrounding the Vatican and the secrets it holds, the theory that God and religion were created to not only keep people in line, but to give them hope and a reason to live. 
While I do believe there may be a smidgen of truth there, I do not believe that this, the life we're living, is all there is. That this is all we are and all we're ever going to be. That we are born, we live, we die, and that's it. That is not my belief. And honestly, I have hard a hard time believing that anyone can 100% believe this. Because when you really think about it, how can this be it? Why would we exist at all if there were no higher purpose or reason for existence? We could talk about the conspiracy theories and such for hours, but that's for another podcast, LOL. Here's a thank you for not continuing on with that, Kim. That would be a, you're right, that is a whole new conversation. Uh, so here's where my skepticism about who and what God is coming from. I was watching one of Dr. Stephen Greer's movies, and I heard a story that hit home for me. My thoughts on Dr. Greer and his beliefs, etc., play no part in my beliefs. It just happens to be where I heard this story the first time. He was discussing all the presidents who had voiced an interest in UFOs, and who all promised that when they became president, they would disclose the truth. As you know, to paraphrase the great Fox Mulder, the truth is still out there, waiting to be discovered. When former President Jimmy Carter insisted on being read in on the whole Area 51, Aliens Exist topic, it was then director of the CIA George H.W. Bush who told Jimmy Carter something that caused the president to put his head in his hands and literally cry. This greatly disturbed me. I pondered it for weeks because to me it meant that the truth was so disturbing that telling the world would cause great upheaval. This further cemented, at least in my brain, the theory that religion was created to keep the world from disintegrating into madness. But then another thought occurred to me. I've never really cared much for UFO stories because to me, they really aren't a mystery. I don't know how anyone can truly believe that in a universe as big as ours, we could be the only life that exists. In my opinion, that is a preposterous notion, but again, that's just what I believe. But the thought that God is actually an alien is actually quite plausible to me and really very interesting. I don't feel that, in, in, that it in any way diminishes or dismisses the word of God from the Bible. Why does it matter who God is or where he came from? The important thing to me is that he exists, he watches over us, and he hears our prayers. Whether he's a man sitting on a golden throne in heaven or an alien lord somewhere in a faraway galaxy, as long as he's real and he can hear me, that's all that matters to me. Darren, I know this letter was long and probably full of information uh, that I didn't need to share, but I wanted to throw that out there to the weirdo family and to you and to get your take on it. I totally respect your beliefs and I respect you as a person. What you do brings, uh, what you do brings joy to so many people and the work you do to help others fight depression is just awesome. I feel truly blessed to have found your podcast and to be a part of this weirdo family and it truly does feel like a family. When I see you've not posted for a couple of days, I worry about you, just like I would a good friend who I haven't heard from in a few days. I hope you'll take this letter for what it is, simply an opinion shared with a group of friends that might create some worthwhile dialogue. Please keep on doing what you do. You really do make a difference in people's lives, and I know that God, no matter who or where he is, will continue to bless you and your bride because you deserve nothing less. Respectfully and sincerely, Kim. <sighs> okay. I'm kind of wishing I had read this in advance because I probably wouldn't have shared it. Uh, this is a mind this oh, mind blower. Um, all right, you're right that I don't I don't agree with you um, if when it comes to God being an alien. Assuming well, what is your definition of an alien? If alien just means not of Earth, then yeah, God could be an alien because. He's not of this world. He's the one that created this world. So I guess in, a, in, in that kind of definition, he'd be an alien. But I know that's not what you're referring to. Um, I don't believe that would be the case. I don't... And I, I don't... And it's not the same God. Uh, because if, if God is... Let's say God is like an extraterrestrial from another planet and he created us. That would mean that God is a created being. And a created being cannot be perfect. So, you would be you would be um, worshiping an imperfect god, which totally totally destroys the whole idea of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus had to come and die for our sins because we're not perfect. He has to be, he had to be perfect in order to die for us in order to take away in order to take our punishment upon himself. He's taking our place for the punishment because sin deserves death. 
spiritual death. Uh, and, well, and physical, but spiritual is what we're talking about. So if God was an alien, he wouldn't be perfect. Um, there's no such thing as perfection in the galaxy except for God himself, because everything, just the whole second law of thermodynamics, everything is winding down. It's becoming less and less complex. It's, it's, it's falling apart, uh, which is another reason that, um, well, never mind. <laughs> I won't go, I won't go, go into that one just yet, just now. But anyway, um, so that's why I wouldn't believe, believe that. Um, I just, I just don't think that that would be. I, I, I just can't see that. Um, I, I believe God created us from nothing. And only God could do that. Because, all right, if, we, if there was an alien, he would have had to have used something in order to create us. He can't, yeah, an alien couldn't create something out of nothing. But even if he did, let, let's, just, let's just say that I did buy into this. Who created the alien then? All right, was that his God, right? Okay, well then, who created his God? The God before that, right? I mean, you could go on back and back and back and back into eternity, and you'd never find the first God if you assume that God is an alien. But if you believe that God never was created because he's always been, which is a hard thing to grasp, I understand that. It's hard to, get our, our, to wrap our minds around that, but God is outside of time. He doesn't exist in the past or in the future or in the present. He is everywhere, all the time, at all times, eternity. That's what eternity is. Eternity doesn't mean forever. Forever means now and continuing on and on and on and on and on and on, you know, ongoing. Eternity is everything at the same time, everything in the past, everything in the future, all in one single tiny little moment. That's eternity and that's where God lives. So, uh... And I forgot where I, I missed where, <laughs> where I was going with that. Uh, oh, yeah, he created time. So he would not be, you know, so he would not be bound by it. Um, so anyway, so that, that, that's where I'm going with that. We, I could go further, but and, and I, I totally see where, where some people come from with that. I think most people want to believe that if they don't believe in God. Um, you seem to be the exception to the rule because you say you do believe in God. Um, but you're all, and you're not saying that you necessarily do believe in this, but, but, uh, you think it's an intriguing theory. I think most people though, buy into that because they don't like the idea of there being a holy God who would judge their actions and their lives. And, you know, some, some, somebody that you would have to be beholden to somebody whose life truly does belong to that your life belongs to them whether or not you want it to or not you know he created you if you create something it belongs to you and even if that thing decides to run or you know or dis or disobey what you want it to do that doesn't change the fact that it's still yours um like your child uh, i mean you're in in a way i mean but you, you love your child no matter what they do. They might want to disown you, but still, it's your child, and you still love them, and you want the best for them. And uh, you want them to do what you know is best for their lives, even if they don't agree that you have to do those certain things in order to have the best life. That doesn't change you from wanting them to do those things and trying to give them advice, trying to give them guidance. But, you know, they can ignore you. That's that's what kids do. So, all right, I'll move on to that. I know I, that's that's sounding like a church of the undead. I apologize, folks. All right, let's just move on to the next one. This one comes from uh, Sal. He says, hey, Darren, I was just in Chicago over the weekend for uh, a good friend of mine's wedding. My cousin and I flew out from LAX on Friday morning so we could see what a Chicago night had to offer to Los Angeles single guys. Turns out it had too much for us to handle. Ha, 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 ha. The wedding was Saturday. It was a beautiful moment that we were able to share with our childhood friend, or as we LA folk call it, day one sandbox homies. Sunday, we decided to explore the surrounding towns. We ended up in Justice. We had a few bars and a bowling alley, which was awesome. We took an Uber to uh, the Venetian Gardens for dinner, which a local recommended. The food was delicious. We took another Uber back to where we parked our car in Justice. The driver went down Archer Road. Ah, Archer Road. There it is. Uh, it was dark and kind of creepy, but I love that kind of stuff. I was chatting with the driver when he spotted a young girl wearing what looked to be to be a white hoodie walking pretty fast on the side of the road. 
She looked like she was going to walk into the road, so he flashed the high beams at her to get her attention. She ever so slightly looked over her shoulder and moved back onto the side of the road. He said, I'm going to ask if she's okay. If she needs a ride, would you be okay for her to ride with us? I responded, I don't think she's going to want to get in the car with three dudes. All of a sudden, he stepped on it and yelled, F that! I asked, dude, what the heck's your problem? He drove away fast until we got to a main street, and then he tells me with tears in his eyes, that, my friend, was Resurrection Mary. I felt like a bucket of ice water was thrown at me, followed by a bucket of hot water. It was crazy. I turned back to look at my cousin with his eyes wide and filled with fear and tears, and he says, her feet weren't touching the ground. I haven't slept since that night. Thank you for your time, Darren, signed, Sal. Well, hopefully you have um, slept since then. Uh, you sent this to me a week ago, so <laughs> hopefully you're, you're doing all right now. I wouldn't. I've never heard of uh, Resurrection Mary wearing a hoodie. Um, for, she's the, uh, the the ghost is supposed to be so old, you would expect it to be wearing dated clothing, you know, period clothing or something. Uh, I, I don't know. What, whatever. Who, who who knows when it comes to ghosts' clothes? Yeah, maybe they have a maybe they have a ghost outlet somewhere, and they, they shop at the weird darkness store and buy their own hoodies and stuff. I have no idea. Whatever that is, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I I can understand I can understand that being a little bit uh, freaky, not for you, I'm, but but the Uber driver. So that that's what would scare me. If if I was seeing it, I would immediately think, hey, there's a girl on the side of the road. I'm on Archer Road. She's wearing white. I would immediately think Resurrection Mary. I wouldn't necessarily believe it's happening, but it would definitely come to mind. But when the Uber driver freaks out on you and, st <laughs> and pulls away like that, and you don't know why he's freaking out until he tells you later. Uh, that's a terrible way. What kind of a rating did you give him? I'm just kind of curious about that because you're, you're not going to pull that stunt if you really do want to continue driving for Uber. Uh, <laughs> that's that's pretty good. That's pretty good. By the way, uh, I did, was it last year, I think, maybe the year before, I did a drive-through um, of Resurrection Cemetery. I happened to be on Archer Road you know, out there for a paranormal conference for Paranormal Chicago, and I realized that I was there in the area, so I went ahead and just drove through it. It's daytime, so it doesn't set. It, it's not. It's not creepy at all during the daytime. It's actually a very beautiful cemetery, but uh, I'll try and look for the video on that, and I will post a link to it in the in the uh, in the show notes. Uh, so that way, you guys, if you want to check out check it out, uh, you can. Let me write that down here. Video Mary. That'll, that'll be enough. That, that will remind me. Okay. So Thank you very much for the email, uh, Alex. I appreciate it. Okay, this next one uh, comes from... Let's see. From Carrie. She says, I know a lot of people have a story out there of the shadow man. This happens to be true, though. I'm not a 15 or 13 year old. When when you're young, it's easy for your imagination to run wild. I was in my late. I was in my late. I know she, she doesn't say. She doesn't say what age she was. I was in my late. I know a lot of people. Um, okay, there it is. All right, she, all right. When you're all right, she was in her late 20s. I started experiencing sleep paralysis. I do not know what brought this on. I've researched and read everything I could on this subject. I suppose stress could have been a factor. I've always been a stressed out kind of person though, so why now? Why not before? It still does not make any sense to me. I definitely had worse stress than I was experiencing then. It presented a cause to me in later times, how, uh, times how be it. Uh, what I do know, this is not a friendly, watch out for you kind of entity. This is not child's play either, it is evil and dark. Um, I know a lot of people have, okay, there it is. It started when I moved into a rental one summer. Things started quickly. I would put something down only to have it disappear. I assumed I had mislaid it somewhere. You know what they say about that, though. Chalked it up to stress. Next, I was trying to ignore it. I thought it was my imagination. That was wishful thinking. This went on for some time. I started asking and looking for some answers. The town I live in is small. It's halfway up a mountain. At night, it's so foggy you can hardly see. It doesn't matter what season or temperature. I know humidity will cause it, but so will frost. Strange. I've seen weird lights, heard things you cannot imagine. I leave for work around 3 a.m. for work every morning. I was about to make a left turn. 
I checked once more before turning. In the car's headlights, there was a black shadow, male form with a top hat. It did touch the highway, but floated or... Oh, it didn't touch the highway, but floated or glided across. It was about two feet above the highway. You could see its form. It looked as if it were making its way across the tree line. It just disappeared. Then two green eyes appeared. Believe me, I floored it. That night was terrifying for me. Rest of the story, I got the hell out of there. Okay, I have, that's the first time I've heard of uh, the Shadow Man having, excuse me, the Hat Man having green eyes. Uh, there's people say that there's a difference between the Hat Man and Shadow People, but yeah, um, definitely scary. I would be wondering, see, the skeptic in me, I'd, I'd want to stop and look. Not at the not at that moment, but maybe later I'd come back to that same area, like in the daytime, and see if somebody, you know, put a rope across the road or something, and pulled something across as somebody was driving driving through, just to scare them like they did you. It'd be a very mean trick to do, but all right. Anyway, okay, Whew. still got some to go here. This next one comes from Sam. The story isn't really paranormal, but it does have to do with a Ouija board and two very scared girls. Back when I was a teenager, my best friend was sleeping over one night. I had a glow-in-the-dark Ouija board, and as, teen, as teenage girls do, we charged it up, turned off the lights in my room upstairs, closed the door, and started playing around with it on my bed. We never had any luck contacting spirits before, but it was still fun to try, and we were really into it since the mood was perfect with it being nighttime and with all the lights out. All of a sudden, we hear this loud banging on my bedroom door, and the doorknobs start rattling. We hear this loud growling, roaring from the other side of it, and me and my friend are almost peeing ourselves from fear and screaming our heads off. My friend jumps into my lap, and I grab the back of her shirt and hide my face into her back, both still screaming. My bedroom door opens, and there's my dad laughing and turning on the light. He looks at us, we're almost in tears being so scared. He looks at the Ouija board on the bed and bursts out laughing even harder and goes, so that's why you two were screaming so much. I had no clue you were playing with that. My dad likes to play tricks on people and was heading up to bed and noticed we were being a bit too quiet and decided to scare us. Needless to say, it worked better than he had planned and it's still a fun story to tell. I don't think I've touched a Ouija board since. Thanks for reading this, signed Sam. Well, there you go, Sam. Yeah, uh, good dad. He, he scared you away from Ouija boards. You don't play with them anymore. That's that is a great parental lesson right there. Uh, looks like okay. We have another uh, Sam. This one says Samantha. All right, there we go. Um, Weird Darkness fan. I have the following very true story. A little over a decade ago, my husband and I rented a hundred-year-old remote rural Alabama farmhouse on a sprawling 81 acres of land. We just finished unpacking and settling in that first week and decided to take a break and go out for dinner. Upon our happy return, we were met by a scene out of a horror movie. Our, our four-poster antique bed was filled with bugs that kept appearing out of nowhere and falling in layers onto the bed. This was happening only on our bed. As one has to do, we checked all possible crevices, including ceiling and walls, and there was nothing coming through. So. We gathered the entire king-size comforter, left it outside, and slept in a guest room. The months following, there were no more myst uh, there were no more myst uh, mystical bugs. However, there was constant scratching noises in the walls. The home had no vermin or rats. I didn't pay attention to scratching sounds and elected to put earplugs on to muffle the sounds. Since whatever it was wasn't garnering our attention, on several nights a large, dark apparition looking like what I could only describe as the Grim Reaper, would hover over me and somehow I would feel the presence, wake up, see it, yell at it, since I was so sleepy, say a few Our Fathers and Hail Marys and St. Michael's prayer, and it would go away. My husband saw it too and joined in on the prayers. Let me just add at this juncture that I had a very demanding job with the state as a parole officer, so restful sleep was precious. The last incident to happen in this charming old house is as follows. At the time, my Rottweiler dog was very close to me and would sleep at my bedside. One night, my dog woke up by my uh, woke me up by growling, and when I looked, much to my amazement and horror, I saw three people. There were two men and a woman dressed in business attire, 
talking amongst themselves and looking at me. They were ghosts. I could see them, but they were also see-through. I didn't take my eyes off of them and nudged my husband awake and asked if he saw anything. He described them just the same way. They kept talking and pointing at us, but by this point, seeing as my dog was not growling anymore and not sensing any danger and being so sleepy, I told them to keep their voices down, please. I asked them to kindly leave us alone, and we all went back to sleep. Seriously? That's what you did? You got ghosts right there in front of you, and you just quietly asked them to keep it down because you're trying to sleep? <laughs> you are way too cool with this, Samantha. Way too cool. That, uh, that is something I would not be doing. I, I would be freaking. Now, if it's a daily occurrence and they're there all the time, yeah, all right, yeah, then eventually you get used to it. You say, hey, guys, can you keep it down tonight? You know, tomorrow's going to be a rough day. All right, I, I get that. But for your, <laughs> for your first experience to say, hey, keep it down. We're trying to sleep in here. Like they're, they're, like they're teenage kids in the other room and you're... <laughs> That's great. All right, let me, get a, let me get a sip here again before I move on. Okay. Uh, this next one. Uh, comes from, uh, let's see, I just want to make sure they don't want to be anonymous. Okay, from Allison. I've got a creepy one for you. When I was young, we lived in uh, fairly rural Colorado, between Glenwood Springs and Vail. It was New Year's, and I was supposed to spend the night at my bestie's house. Unfortunately, I didn't know until that night that her stepdad was really abusive. Stepdad and her mom spent the night arguing. When he got tired of mom, he turned his anger towards my friend and her brother. I was terrified, but eventually told him to leave everyone alone. I tended to be my bestie's defender at school, so it came pretty natural to defend her at home. He threw me out of the house for my efforts and locked the door behind me. It wasn't that long of a walk to my house, about a half mile, so I headed home. It was really kind of creepy out there, and I was a bit freaked out already by what had happened at my friend's house. And then I saw a man-like shadow just off the road. I ignored him, but picked up my pace. After some yards, I took the chance of sneaking a look over my shoulder. The shadow had moved forward with me. I wasn't far from my house, so I decided to make a sprint for it. I have never been more scared in my life. Luckily, we never locked our doors, so I could just fly in and slam the door behind me. I locked it and then ran through the house locking all of the doors and windows. Once that was done, I peeked out the window by the front door. A man was standing at the base of our driveway. I headed to our kitchen and sat, hidden by the counters with my dad's chef knife in my grip until my dad and stepmother got home from their New Year's celebration. I never told them what had happened on my way home, just that things had gotten upsetting at my bestie's house and I couldn't sleep. Next day, we heard that Ted Bundy had escaped from the Glenwood Springs jail just west of us. Was it him? Rationally, as an adult, I know it probably wasn't, but whoever it was, he scared the heck out of me nonetheless. Wow, yeah. Ted Bundy, yeah, he, he escaped twice from custody, so I don't know if that was him or not, but yeah, that would have freaked me out. Although, saying that, I have to, I'm wondering if maybe it was actually a supernatural entity. Uh, coming out of such a dark, creepy... Um, tension-filled situation with your with your best friend's house I almost wonder if maybe like a like a spirit attached itself to you a spirit of anger or or whatever um, and and kind of followed you home you know maybe trying to attach itself to you just just a guess I don't know you would you would think how do, what does that say about me that I'm more willing to believe a supernatural entity than it was Ted Bundy <laughs> who was a real person that Okay, man, I gotta I gotta check myself on this on this stuff once in a while. All right. Anyway, thank you very much for the email, Allison. Appreciate that. Uh, this next one comes from Jane. She says, "Hey, my name is Jane. Live in Erie, Pennsylvania, an appropriately placed, uh, appropriately named place. Uh, my husband and I currently live in a house that his grandparents lived in. We bought the house after his grandparents passed. My husband wanted the house to stay in the family. We've lived in this house for the past 29 years." When we first moved in, I did feel like someone was checking in on us, but nothing ever bad. We did renovations on the house, including the basement. In the basement, there was an old pool table that wasn't in good condition, so we broke up the pool table and bagged up all the billiard balls and cue sticks and threw them away. I even watched the garbage men load it all up. Several years later, after renovating the basement, 
we adopted two cats that would love to spend time in the basement. One day I found our cat Pouncer by the water heater playing with something. I reached down to pick up what he was batting around. What I found really shocked me. There was the white cue ball from the pool table that we had broken up and thrown into the garbage several years earlier. I know the first thing most people think is that we missed this cue ball and it was under the water heater. Well, that water heater was replaced a couple of years after we got rid of the pool table and a new furnace was put in too. There wasn't any possible way that cue ball could have been back in that basement. I remember putting it in the, gar in the uh, garbage bag myself. Thank you for letting me share my story. I've had many more experiences in my life. Seems like I have experiences in almost, uh, in almost every place I've lived in. Been experiencing this since I was a teenager. Thank you. Jane, so right, so you got a pool playing ghost. Nice. So, um, yeah, so you've got it, the Annabelle doll thing going. You throw it away and it comes back to you. Annabelle, kids, to kids balls. Now, 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 a, a, a billiard ball, the cue ball. <sighs> well, it could be, could it be a, it could be a cursed object, I guess, or a haunted object. I don't know. I've never. I wouldn't. Why? Why would it be a cue ball? That would be possessed, though. I mean, you could be a really, really uh, great pool player, love playing the game, but why would you attach yourself to the cue ball? That's that. I could a pool cue. I could maybe see. I could see the a pool table. See again. Why am I rationalizing one thing but not the others? You're getting a little insight into the mind of Marler here, folks. <laughs> All right, moving on. This one comes from Emma. As promised, my true spooky tale, although I'll admit as scary as it was at the time, it now just seems quite bizarre. All right, well, let's see what Emma has to say then. I'm writing this from my studio, looking out onto several acres of very windy and drizzly woodlands in the not-so-sunny South Wales village of Glanaman, UK. Glanaman? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. After hearing your recent story about the Amundford couple who fled their home after recording strange noises underground, it inspired me to write in and tell you of our little spooky encounter whilst living in our old house. Our old house was set in the next village to where we currently live. Whilst waiting for this property to become available, we were living in a little miner's cottage set in a lovely, quiet little row of only eight houses, ours being the middle. Story had it that someone was once murdered on this street, and apparently the murderer hid and then fled from here as there's a train track at the bottom of the garden. Anyway, I digress. The story is unrelated, and although we knew of this old tale, the house had always seemed nice and calm despite being built in 1905 and probably having seen quite its share of passings. To the front of our property was a small walled section with a front gate which separated our house from the road. We have a small dog, so upon returning, whoever was last in always shut the gate, so if the front door was ever opened, the dog couldn't run out onto the road. This part's important, as it was a particularly creaky metal gate. On the night in question, it was a cold but calm autumn night, far enough on in the year that it was dark fairly early, so we had all the candles lit and were relaxing, watching TV. At the time, we had a curved settee where either end reclined, which tended to mean we would sit on opposite ends so as to take advantage of our own recliners. We were quite alarmed to hear what sounded like someone turning the handle on our front door and trying to enter. We knew this wasn't possible, as the gate had not opened so no one could be at the front door. Then a few moments later, I felt an icy blast drift past me as if someone had opened the fridge right beside me. Uh, the refrigerator door right beside me. At first, I wasn't sure what had just happened. That was until I looked over at my fiancé, and before I could tell him what had happened, he exclaimed, Did you just feel that? I've gone ice cold. It was as if something had walked past me and gone straight over to him. The night went on without further incident. That was, however, until we went to sleep. We were awoken in the early hours of the morning to what sounded like someone bouncing a ball against the wall in our bedroom. This went on for a couple of minutes and then moved to the stairs, sounding as, as if someone was rolling a ball down the stairs. You know, you know, when it'll bounce down a couple, miss some, and then continue down. Bounce, bounce, miss, bounce, bounce, bounce. The, fina the uh, finale was when the ball appeared to be rolling along the boards in our attic. 
All in all, the whole experience lasted approximately 15 to 20 minutes. Now, there are a few things to note here, but the main is that all these sounded as if the ball was being bounced or rolled along on a wooden, on a wooden floor. We had carpet on the stairs, and the attic had been insulated under one of the warm home schemes, meaning there was no exposed beams, they were all inches deep in foamy insulation. We lived between two elderly neighbors, both of which lived alone with no children in any of the nearby houses. The final twist to the tale was when I was talking to one of my neighbors a few days later when I couldn't stop thinking about our late night encounter. I asked him if in all the years he'd lived there, if he had heard any strange noises. His reply left me even more surprised. After a short pause, he said that nothing had really happened in his house. The only noise he used to hear was me bouncing the ball for the dog on the skirting board in the hallway. Our dog never owned a ball. I gave up buying them as a puppy when he was a puppy, and he refused to bring them back. Despite us now living in a 1600s farmhouse with at least one death on the property, I'm pleased to report all is calm. That's, however, apart from the occasional waft of cigarettes when neither of us smoke or the shadow of a small animal assumed to be a cat that can be seen walking through the kitchen towards the living room. And finally, whatever it is that our dog can see on the yard that he regularly stands and growls at. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed our spooky tale of the night a ghost decided to come in the house, hide out for a few hours, then wake us up in the middle of the night to play ball. From Weirdo listeners Emma and Hugh. Thank you, guys. Great story. I really appreciate you sharing that with me. Emma and Hugh. 1600s? Your, your, your house was built? That is an old house. 400-year-old house. That is amazing. Well, then again, you're in the UK, so you're going to have some old houses there, but <laughs> that old. We're so used to here in, the, here in the States thinking, ooh, the 1800s, wow, that is ancient. How, how can you live in a house that old? And you're in the 1600s. You've got castles, for crying out loud. You can live, you can live in something that's thousands of years old. But uh, again, the bouncing ball. What is it with bouncing balls uh, for this Fireside Frights? If you've never seen the movie The Changeling, starring George C. Scott, you really do need to see it. It's, it is definitely something that uh, every time one of these stories pops up, that's what I feel like we're, you know, I feel like I'm watching here in my head, talking about the ball going down the stairs, something rolling or rolling back and forth in the attic, that kind of thing. All right, this next one comes from, uh, from, uh, oh, wow. Uh, uh, she goes, she goes by Addie, but apparently her real name is Adarin. So very, very similar to mine in pronunciation, not spelled the same, but still, that's kind of cool. Anyway, first of all, I've been a self-professed atheist. I was raised Christian, but I've recently gotten back into magic spell work while working with a few deities. It's an interesting journey. And second, my possible paranormal experiences. See, mom passed away in 2019, and at the time, I wasn't open to the idea of any sort of afterlife, and I just accepted the fact that she was now gone. But now, as of this year, things have been happening around my house that are just off. One, I was downstairs in the kitchen and heard something slash someone walking from the living room and the, through the dining room towards me, but I saw nothing. Two, about a month or so ago, I was about to leave for work and was holding my bedroom door ajar and suddenly felt it being jerked closed. I looked and there was no one on either side of my door. Three, Around a couple weeks ago, I was just leaving the laundry room down the hall from my room, and after I closed the door and was about to close the door, the laundry room kept thumping against the door frame. It really spooked me. Four, both times this morning, when I went to go out for a smoke on the back porch, I found a cigarette butt placed in the middle of the chair the first time, and the second time I found one to the side of the chair. No one else was awake at this time, and we live on a few acres. Sorry for the long message, Darren. I look forward to hearing from you and the next podcast you drop. Love your content. Thank you, Addy. Well, thank you, Addy. I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, they, uh, they, got a good, they got a good story here. They do. Uh, the cigarettes would definitely be the thing that, that, that would throw me a little bit, especially since you live on several acres and nobody else was around. Uh, the downstairs, hearing something, walking... That seems to be something that people talk about on a regular basis, and I'm sure the experts would come in, the skeptics, and try to explain that one away. Um, 
your the, the door being ajar and feeling it being jerked closed. Yeah, there you know that one. That's a good one. That's <laughs> that's a good one, Addy. That that one that one would be a little bit harder to explain. Oh, it was just a draft. Yeah, right. Like, like, like drafts pull the door against you like that. Um, the laundry room. I I had a hard time understanding exactly what you were talking about. That I don't know if the laundry, like if like if the uh, the washer was was pounding or if it was the door that was pounding. But anyway, thank you very much for the email, Addy. I I appreciate it. Okay, this next one comes from. We'll just use the letter K. Uh, my husband and I just finished building our dream home. I was a, it was an old farmland his grandfather used to own. It's nestled among trees and a creek runs behind. No home had ever been built there. One night, when we were still getting settled in, I stretched out on the couch in the living room to watch a movie. My husband was fiddling with something in the back of the house. Usually for me, I drifted off to sleep I, and I woke up as the movie credits were rolling by. Still lying down, I glanced at the front door. A man was standing there, looking at me. I slammed my eyes shut. When I opened them, he was still there. I rubbed my eyes, roughly. He was still there. I watched him. He watched me. I was not scared, but concerned that a strange man had come in the house. He was about five foot eight or so, wearing old-fashioned farmer's clothes, Stetson-like hat, mid-thigh denim jacket. He stood in profile. The room was fairly dark, but I could see he had a sharp nose. I decided I had best sit up, and when I did, he was instantly gone. Over the years, I've tried to convince myself that I was obviously dreaming, except for a couple of things. Primarily was the feeling I had of unspeakable, immense love. Total acceptance. A feeling that I was okay. Also a feeling of pity and a little sadness. These feelings stayed with me for months and months. I felt like the old man just wanted to see what we'd done with the place. After promising myself I would never tell anyone about this, I couldn't hold it in. I felt like I was walking on air when I told my husband, guess what just happened? He immediately said I had described his grandpa. I never knew him or had ever seen a picture of him because he'd been dead for many years before I married my husband. My mother-in-law said the same thing. My husband died of cancer at age 62, here in the house, but I still live here. His grandpa is welcome back anytime. Wow, okay. For, first, very sorry for your loss about uh, losing your husband, especially to cancer. That would be, be a horrible way to go. Interesting that uh, grandpa's welcome. Didn't mention anything about uh, your husband's ghost, so hopefully he's gone on to a better place and he's, and he's happy there. Kind of inter interesting how, how family will stick around like that. This next one comes from Andy. He says, Darren, hello. Hope you're doing well today. After listening to your YouTube channel, I decided to send you our family's experience. And yes, it's true. It may not be the most frightening or bizarre experience you've read, but it sure was interesting living through it. Hope you have a nice rest of your day. Thanks, Darren. Signed, Andy. All right. Well, then let's take a look at Andy's story here and see what he has to say. He calls it simply our paranormal experience dream home. Nice. <clears throat> oh, this is a long one. Let me take another step, another uh, drip, or another drip, another sip. It'd be a drip if it was coffee, but it's not not coffee this time around. Okay. I'm starting to lose my voice, but I'm also seeing an ending to these emails coming soon. So maybe I, maybe I can make it through. <coughs> All right, um, where am I? Andy, and here is your, okay. In November 2009, my wife and I moved just a few miles away from where we were living in the city in our dream home that sits on two acres out in the country here in southwest Michigan. The home we purchased was only four years old and sold to us by a young couple who built the house themselves and had two young children. We had one daughter at the time who was three years old. We were in a hurry to get moved in because days after we moved into the home, I was leaving for a two-week mission trip to Zambia, Africa. One evening after I returned from Africa, my wife and I were sitting in bed and heard a crash coming from the basement bathroom. I went down to find the shower curtain rod, with no curtain yet installed on it, laying on the floor. I didn't think much of it at the time, I just figured that perhaps the previous owner had not installed it correctly. 
A few nights later, I awakened around 2 a.m. to find a living room light on outside our bedroom. My wife slept as I got up to turn it off, as the light was annoyingly keeping me awake. In the morning, I told her that she left a light on in the living room when she went to bed and that it woke me up during the night. She insisted it was totally dark when she went to bed after me. I checked the light bulb, and it was firmly screwed into the socket. It was not a touch lamp, so I could not figure out how it came on by itself. Our daughter uh, had not gotten up during the night to turn it on either. A few months later, after I came home from a business trip, my wife stated that while I was away, our three-year-old daughter came out of her room one afternoon where she was playing and asked, where's daddy? My wife explained to her that I was still on my business trip. She said our daughter insisted that I must be home because she heard my voice talking to her as if I were in the room with her. A few months later, my wife and daughter were in our basement while I was at work one afternoon. My wife said she froze as she heard multiple voices upstairs. She could hear them speaking, but could not make out what they were saying. She thought perhaps they were robbers and was terrified for her and our daughter's safety. She thought it was odd that she did not hear footsteps, though. The voices then abruptly stopped a few moments, a few moments later. After a lengthy amount of time, she slowly went upstairs to find that no one was there and had not been there. She could not figure out who or what had been upstairs talking. By spring of 2011, we had a second daughter. Late each night, I'd wake up to use our master bath toilet and then leave our bedroom to walk down the hallway to check on the girls who shared a bedroom. One night, I went to our bathroom and then walked through our dark bedroom to head to their room. Just a few feet before making it through our bedroom doorway, the lamp on the end table next to our couch right outside our bedroom door came on. It illuminated the room I was about to enter. I froze. With my heart racing, my first thoughts were that someone had broken into the house. After a few moments, I rationalized that I would have heard at least something in all that silence, like soft steps walking across the carpet. It also didn't make sense that a thief breaking into a home at night would turn on the most obvious lighting source in the center of the house. I gathered my courage and took a few extra steps to walk into the bright living room where the lamp was. I found that no one was there. The next morning, when I told my wife what had happened, I could not explain to her or understand myself how that lamp came on in the middle of the night at that very moment I was about to enter the room. Combined with everything else that had happened, this is when we really felt as if something paranormal was coming into our, was uh, occurring in our home. A few other things happened over the next few years that we could also not explain. I finally phoned the previous owners one afternoon and made small talk for a while. I told them that we loved the house and we were grateful that they sold it to us years prior. I asked them if they had ever had anything odd happen in the four years that they lived in the house. When they asked what I meant, I explained the multiple events that we'd experienced. While they agreed that the events we experienced were eerie, they insisted that they had not had one thing happen in their four years of living in the home. One evening in 2013, after we had put our daughters to bed, I was in the kitchen with our small dog, Sugar. It was dark except for the glow of our laptop computer at a nearby table. I bent over to give a, a, give a dog cookie to Sugar. When I stood up, a female voice whispered, hey, very clearly in my left ear. Because my wife would frequently want to show me something she found on the internet, I looked over at the laptop computer, thinking I would see my wife. The chair was empty. I quickly went into my daughter's bedroom, a few steps away, thinking my wife was by our girls' beds and had whispered out to me from there. She wasn't there either. I went down the hallway to the other end of the house to find my wife in bed with the blankets over her reading a book. I asked if she had tiptoed real quickly down here after saying something to me in the kitchen. My now only 30 to 45 seconds, if that had passed since I heard the woman's whisper in my ear. My wife replied, you finally heard voices too, didn't you? For the previous four years, I didn't believe that she and my daughter had heard voices in our home. I believed it now, and I could not explain from where these voices were coming. With everything that we experienced up to that point, we didn't necessarily feel afraid, just bewildered and confused. 
None of us were ever physically touched by anything. We never saw any ghostly apparitions. On a Sunday afternoon in 2016, I went into our basement utility room, which houses our water heater and furnace, as well as my tools and workbench, among other household appliances. It's a good-sized room with no windows and just one door. I entered the room to find my power drill in its hard-shell plastic case sitting upright in the middle of the room on the concrete floor. It was as if someone had set it there. I paused for a moment and wondered why I had left it there in the middle of the room. I then realized I hadn't. This drill and case normally sit on a shelf with other encased power tools at a height that makes me stand on my tippy toes to reach it. Of all the power tools in their cases on that shelf, how did just this one come down? How could it have landed in such an upright position and with no damage from the height it fell? I was baffled and put it back on the shelf. Not two days had passed when I entered the utility room once more to now find two wooden slats about four inches wide and two feet long each, um, two feet long each that I used as window props laying in the middle of the room on the concrete floor in the same spot the drill and case had been sitting. They were lying next to each as if someone had placed them there together. It was not as if they had randomly fallen. These slats were normally kept on an upper shelf, approximately eight feet off the floor. This is an area that my wife or small daughters would need a ladder to reach them, if they could even find them. Discovering the drill case and now these slats in the middle of the room all on their own in such a short amount of time frame had me flabbergasted once more. I would not told my wife what had happened with the drill case and wooden slats. About a day later, she told me that she went down to the utility room to get something for dinner out of our extra fridge. When she entered the room, a can of spray paint that was on the floor behind the door got knocked across the room. I got the chills when she told me this. I told her that I had not been using any spray paint for weeks and that those cans were a good six feet away from the door. The door she entered is the only way into that utility room, the only way that this paint can, could, could uh, get behind the door would be for someone to be in the room and to do so. It just wasn't humanly possible to place anything behind the door. I then explained what happened just days earlier with the drill case and wood slats. It was as if something in our home was trying to get our attention. I've lived at many addresses across several states in my adult life and had never had even one of these experiences happen at any of those houses. Because the previous owners never had anything peculiar happen to them, I began to wonder what we had done to bring this into our home. After years of odd and unexplained events, it finally occurred to me what may be causing our bizarre experiences. During my mission trip to Africa, shortly after we moved into the home years earlier, I would brought back multiple wood objects of different sizes. These objects were hand-carved by various villagers in different areas of Zambia through which we traveled. Perhaps one of these wood carvings, I thought, could contain an evil entity. Witchcraft is very much alive in that part of Africa, so while I could not prove it definitively, I believed this to be a strong reason for what was happening in our home. Shortly after the utility room incidents, I put an end to what was happening. I went downstairs one night to get something from our basement. Even though the basement was dark, I didn't turn on the lights as I knew it would be a quick trip down and back to grab what I needed. As I entered the basement, I passed by a window that faces our backyard. The window alarm went off and it startled me. This is the type of alarm that needs the windows to physically open to make the alarm trigger. All I had done was walk by it. Like the lamp going on years earlier, this alarm waited until I was near it to go off and loudly sound. I had had enough. Being a devout Christian, I said out loud, you will no longer bother my family and you are not welcome in this home. In the powerful name of Jesus Christ, you will leave and you will not return. I'll admit my heart rate was up there a bit. I paused for a moment in the silence as if awaiting a response and then went back upstairs. My wife immediately heard from me what had happened with the window alarm and what I said out loud afterwards. Although we experienced seven years of unexplainable events and voices, no one in our family has had another incident in our home since it, whatever it was, 
was commanded to leave. <laughs> oh, Andy, what a great, uh, well, I, was, I want to say testimony or story. What a, that is amazing. When I was reading through that, before you got to the end where you were talking about the carved object that you brought back, I was picturing in my head somebody that worked with their hands. Somebody who liked working with power tools or with tools in general, maybe working with wood, maybe working with electricity, uh, working on houses, stuff like that, because the, you know the lights turning on, the uh, you know the the drill, the, the the wood slats. It just it for some reason in my head I was thinking of somebody that somebody that, that liked to work with their hands, you know, like a like a handyman type of thing. So when you got to the Zambia um, wooden thing that you brought back, the wooden um, artifact, that kind of made sense because that would have been made by hand by somebody who was really good with their hands and really good with working with wood and stuff like that. And so I was kind of on the same same wavelength, but I did not did not expect a cursed object. Uh, that that definitely was not my thing. But man, you you knocked it out of the park when you got to told this thing to get out in the name of Jesus Christ. So many of these stories work that way. When, when, if somebody doesn't believe in, in Christ, they'll go and they'll try to, uh, to use sage or something like that. Um, and sometimes they'll try to make, try to make uh, friends with the spirit. Okay, whatever. But so many times if it's an evil spirit, it won't go away until the name of Jesus Christ is said. It is amazing how often that happens. And this is not just me being religious, even though I... I am, and I'm going to be a bit biased towards this solution. It happens so often, you have to wonder why, unless there truly is power in Jesus Christ, because that's the only thing that explains it, especially the sleep paralysis incidents. So many of those, people can't get out of them. Not, not all of them, obviously, because we've sh shared some that don't, but so many, um, they'll get out of it by by asking Jesus to save them or telling the demon or whatever it is to get out in Jesus name. It's amazing how often that happens. And when somebody do, and they'll they'll have repeat sleep paralysis incidents sometimes. But those those who use Jesus name don't. At least not that I've heard of. If you're if you're somebody who has sleep paralysis and you have, you know, tossed this tossed out the demon in Jesus Christ's name and it left you alone, if it did come back, I want to know because I, I would like to know about that. But I've never heard of it happening before. Somebody, somebody saying you are not welcome here in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. You will leave and you will not return. That's those are some powerful words, man. So well done. I knew you were a Christian right from the get go because you said that you were on a missions trip in Zambia. So I knew right then and there. Okay, this guy's going to be a, a, a man of faith. He's going to have, have an interesting story. Uh, really appreciate that. Thank you so much for sending it, Andy. Okay, this next one comes from uh, Crystal. Hi, Darren. I don't know if you still have interest in imaginary friends stories. Of course I do, Crystal. Of course I do. Uh, but I have a story of something some adults might call imaginary. It started when I was about four or five years old. My parents moved into a house with me and my newborn sister. A friend of theirs wanted us to house sit for a year. I remember it was an old house, almost a farmhouse. I loved and hated that house. I had a big bedroom, at least to me, that had a bed, a small dresser, and a small table I liked to use. It also had a bay window with cushions to sit on the bench where I loved to sit and stare outside. The bed was on loud springs and also old, which would alert my parents when I was up. Despite this bucolic setting, gr good word usage there, uh, I felt things that were wrong about the house. First, I absolutely refused to go into the basement. There was a demon. Yes, I knew what one was called. There, uh, there was a demon there that I was convinced would hurt me. My mom tried to coax and or demand I go down there with her, but I'd make such a fuss not to. Once, I only went halfway down the steps before I planted my butt and wouldn't go further. During this time, I started having terrible nightmares, now described as night terrors. I remember only pieces of the dreams, but I do remember being terrified by what I called the Demon of Demons. Wow, that's not ominous at all. Okay, 
Um, I understood it liked to torment children, and I was his choice of the moment. Uh, I would wake up sitting bolt upright, eyes wide with tears and fear. I'd scream for my parents to comfort me or run for the comfort of the bay window. I'd then try to stay awake by leaning against the coolness of the window, watching for the sun to come up or daddy to get in the car for work. Once either of those happened, I felt safe enough to climb back into bed until mom came to wake me up for the day. Sometimes I lost the battle with the Sandman and fell back to sleep. Many times, the terrorizing renewed, even there. Even after my family fulfilled our job and moved to a house a few miles away, the demon continued its torment on me. This lasted until we moved north after I finished second grade. I felt relieved once I realized I was safe from it. That lasted until I was in my early 20s when I met a girl who by then shared my interest in things paranormal and was considered to be new age. One night, my friend, her boyfriend, and I were sitting in my room talking and being young adults in general. At one point, the boyfriend seemed different. He managed to say, I don't feel right. Then the boyfriend wasn't him anymore. The thing said hello to us, but told my friend he wasn't here for her. Its gaze leveled on me, and a smile slid across its lips. Do you remember me, little girl? It asked. As I saw horns and tusks outline the boyfriend's head, shoulders, arms, and torso, I suddenly felt small and scared again as I answered and choked, yes. It laughed, replying, good, and then asked, do you still fear me? I swallowed hard, which helped me find the courage to say, no, not anymore. Apparently, it was not convinced and asked why. I simply told it, I stopped you. It should be noted that by that point in my life, I'd convinced myself the nightmares stopped because I'd taught myself how to block it from coming to me. I was wrong, however. The demon told me it left because I got too old to be any more fun with. Then it decided I wasn't worthy anymore. I did the snort, smirk, and oh really to him, which he clearly did not like. He tried to say more, to try and scare me again, but I had enough. With a confidence I didn't feel, I told him, told it that it wasn't welcome anymore and declared it to be banished from my friend Anne House. With the final, I'm not finished with you, and a couple other idle threats, I reiterated my banishment declaration. It was then the boyfriend uncurled himself and stretched his somehow aching body. He asked what happened, and we told him all that transpired as we each understood it. I explained the short version of what I'd already told you and your readers. The boyfriend then said, I feel like I want to eat raw, fresh meat, as he rubbed and flexed his jaw. We all nervously laughed and proceeded to break down what kind of demon it could be, have me give any additional information I could, and so on. We soon quit that endeavor and then went home, and they went home. Thankfully, I have not had any more issues of that kind again. Well, that's my story. Hope you and the rest of the Weirdo family enjoyed this. My husband and I really enjoy your show, by the way. Thank you, signed Crystal. Well, thank you, Crystal. I appreciate the kind words there at the end, and I'm glad to have you and your husband as part of our weirdo family. I'm glad. That it's really, it's always great when I hear of couples listening to the show together. That's 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 rare for podcasts. Most people are listening in their car, driving to work, or something like that, or maybe going to sleep at night. It's neat when when people are listening together. So thank you for sharing that. What a story, though. Now, at first. If it wasn't for what you saw, I would have said, okay, the boyfriend, he probably, maybe you'd shared this story before, and so he knew about it, and so he was playing playing along, playing around with you, you know, trying to scare you, but you saw on the face the horns and everything come on, come on to him. And so you, you can't fake that. So I'm guessing this really was something that you had dealt with. And as a little kid, as a tiny kid, four or five years old, Something that you that you experienced called the demon of demons? Who comes up with that at four or five years old? You might know the concept of a demon. Well, when you, as a kid, like four or five, you probably know the concept of the devil because you've seen all the cartoonish pictures of him. The red suit, the forked tail, you know, carrying around the pitchfork and he has horns. I, I get all that. But to know what an actual demon is and then to to come up with like a demon of demons, to know that there's a hierarchy of demons like that, 
because there is that is that's scary that's I, I almost said impressive but that's for a, for a young child to know that that's really disturbing that really really is so yeah I, th I think something was definitely tormenting you and to to then start hanging out with kids or, or young adults I guess who were of the new age they were not and I don't know your spirituality, so because I, I don't think you mentioned it in, in here. I think I would have would have caught if you said that you were religious or Christian or something. So, you not being Christian and them not being Christian, you know, being pagan or New Age or Wiccan or whatever they were. You you say New Age, um, but they probably weren't protected as well, which made it easier for that demon then to infest the boyfriend at least temporarily. Uh, because if you're a Christian, my this is my what I truly believe. Um, I don't have proof for it, but a lot of I get this because I've heard it from other from people that I trust, and I, it, it makes sense to me. If you are a born again Christian, so you've actually given your life to Christ. You cannot be possessed. You can be oppressed. You know, you can be tormented by demons, but they cannot actually enter you and control you, uh, because. It, in the Bible, it says, he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. Uh, so if Jesus is in you, you've accepted him into your life, a demon can't take his place. He's in you. So the, he sto that stops that from happening. Um, so that's at, at first, when, I, when you said that you, you had stopped it, I thought, okay, well, maybe that's what she meant. But no, you had actually just, you thought you'd found a way to, to keep it away. But so th very cool story, man. I really appreciate that, Crystal. Thank you so much for sharing it. Uh, let's see here. I've got, oh, wow, we're almost done. Two more. All right. Um, dear Mr. Marler, I'm from North Carolina. Not, oh, by the way, this comes from uh, Cindy. I'm from North Carolina, not far from the Devil's Tramping Ground. I thought I knew everything about the Devil's Tramping Ground, but I learned a couple of new things about it from your podcast. I've listened to many, many, many podcasts like yours, and yours is by far the best. Well, thank you so much. You're, you're so... <laughs> I appreciate that. That's very nice of you. Uh, your voice is so easy to listen to. Cool. Well, let me before I get continue on, let me write down Devil's Tramping Ground. I'll, I'll put a link to that episode in the show notes as well in case anybody hasn't seen it. It's actually a very recent episode, so you probably all have already heard it, but just in case, I'll put that down there. So I need to look for the uh, Resurrection Mary video that I made and the Devil's Tramping Ground um, episode. Somebody, oh, that's yes, right. We also talked about imaginary friends. Let me Let me write down that episode as well just so ever just so i can make sure to get to it okay all right uh anyway uh she says i have two paranormal experiences to share with you both auditory the first was when i was staying with a friend whose house was way off the road in the woods by itself it was a very old house she and her boyfriend were in the process of renovating it she and i were sitting on the couch chit-chatting and having a beer when from the back of the house a clear low, male voice says her name. We both jumped and looked at each other and asked each other, did you just hear that? Her boyfriend, nor anyone else, was there at the time and with no road nor houses close by, so we know it was not of this plane. I get chills just remembering that. The second was a year or so after my grandfather went home to Jesus. My entire life he would call for my grandmother when she was in another room to do different things for him. For example, Ethel, call so-and-so for me, or Ethel, bring me my hat. He always did this. Even when he got sick in the nursing home, he would call for her. A year or so after my grandfather passed, my brother, my son, and I were in my grandmother's kitchen with her just talking. When out of nowhere, we hear a shout from the back of the house, Ethel! I knew from my brother and my son's faces, they had also heard it very clearly as I did. My grandmother said, is someone here? She'd heard it too. She looked out the window to see if someone had pulled up in the driveway. No one. My brother and I waited until we left to discuss what we'd heard. My grandmother doesn't believe in the paranormal, even though I know that time she had also witnessed it. My brother, my son, and I all agree that was my grandpa's voice. That gave me chills. Thanks so much for what you do. I love how you put the verses and quotes at the end of each podcast. The podcast gets me through a lot of house chores. If you use my experiences, you can refer to me as Sick Lunch Lady. <laughs> okay, Sick Lunch Lady. I'll, I'll, the, the, instead, instead of Cindy, I'll call you Sick Lunch Lady. That's funny. All right. Uh, yeah, 
That, that's <laughs> you would think your grandmother would actually recognize her husband's voice. Instead of just saying, is there somebody here? You would think, oh my gosh, that's my husband. Yeah, there's, because if, if it's somebody that you know, even if it's somebody from years ago, but you were very, very close to, you know that voice when it comes, like, like if they call you out of the blue, before they even say who they are, you hear that, that voice, you just know it's them. So, if so, and she was so used to him being in another room yelling, Ethel, I would have thought that she probably, you know what, I'm guessing she probably did recognize the voice, she just didn't want to let on because it probably scared her. Uh, not like not like fearful, terrified type of thing, but it would have startled her, especially because because she didn't believe in the paranormal and she didn't know how to explain it. And maybe she wasn't sure exactly, you know, what you had heard. You may have heard somebody yell it too, but but maybe you didn't hear it in your grandpa's voice, you know. But she did, you know. Um, any anything you can to try and rationalize it away. So. All right, uh, let's see here. Moving on to our very last one. All right, this one comes from. Jane. Uh, hi again, it's Jane from Erie, Erie, Pennsylvania. Hey, I truly hope you don't mind that I'm emailing you again. I don't mind it at all. I don't mind you. Feel free to send me as many stories as you would like. Uh, I was listening to your chamber of comments that you had on July 16th. By the way, I think it's truly awesome. It's so very sweet of you to take time out of your day to share your emails as well as answering them. That's the reason why I decided to email you. I was listening to the email from one of your listeners that was quite lengthy but asked a very valid, a great question to me as well. She basically had asked if any, if uh, one can believe in God as well as believe in the supernatural. That really hit home for me. I listened very intently to what she had to share as well as what you shared, so thank you for that. That email had me thinking about an experience I had. Ever since I heard that, I have been kicking around the idea of emailing you. The thought had not left me alone, so here I am. I promise I won't keep bothering you, as I know you truly are a busy person with a lot on your plate. It's just this thought wouldn't leave me alone and kept telling me to share it with you. Uh, you know what? You don't have to. You don't have to apologize for emailing me. Okay, that's that's what Fireside Frights and the Chamber of Comments is all about. I love getting emails from people, and I don't have anybody else sorting through them. I'm the one that reads them. So if you send them to me, I will see them. I, I may not necessarily reply immediately. Sometimes I'll set it off to the side and reply here in a fire, fire, Fireside Frights or in a Chamber of Comments, but I do see them. So and, and I don't mind that at all. I'm in front of a microphone all day long being a, being a professional voice actor. It's what I do. It's a nice little break, actually, when I get emails from people. So don't worry about that, all right? Okay, anyway, continuing on with Jane's email. She says, I haven't shared this uh, with many people in my life, just just those I thought I could trust and those I thought would appreciate it. This experience um, was when I was 29 and I just turned 53 last week. Let me give you a little background info so this might be a bit lengthy so far that I, uh, so far that I do apologize. Oh, I'm sorry, so for that I do apologize. When I was around eight or nine, my mother was in the process of separating from her second husband, my stepfather. He and I never got along and let's just say he was kind of cruel to me. So I went to live with my grandparents for a very short period of time, just until I could be with my mother again. During the time I was with my grandparents, my grandmother made sure to take very good care of me. She was a very devout Catholic and wanted me raised Catholic as well. She made sure I went to church every Sunday and learned and, and learned all I could about God while there. I indeed needed... I, I'm so sorry, folks. I'm stumbling over this one. Her writing is perfectly fine. It's just me. I did indeed learn to accept God and love Him. My mother and I were back together after the school year, and when we were reunited, I did keep, uh, keep up going to church and kept up learning about God. When I became a teenager, I did become lazy and didn't really go to church, but I didn't stop believing in God and prayed to Him every night, thanking Him for the day's blessings. You're not the only one, Jane. I, th I think teenage years is something that we all kind of walk away from church for a while just because we're trying to find ourselves, trying to find out who we really are. You know, do we really believe in this stuff that mom and dad have been teaching us all our lives? And, and quite often we do come back to the church. But yeah, those, those years, that's, that's when I walked away too. Um, she says, I did find something amazing about my praying to God. Now, I'm probably reading too much into this, but I sometimes swear the things I prayed for would happen so fast. I was, it was shortly after I got married, I remember going to the local animal shelter and saw a cat there. I felt so bad for this cat, it was there because its owner had passed away, it didn't have a home anymore. 
I so wanted to adopt this cat, but my hubby wouldn't go for it. So I prayed so hard for this cat to get adopted. I called back the next day to check on it. It literally got adopted an hour before I called. That's just one example I have, but things like that would happen all the time. Here's the experience that I had that still lives with me today. When I was 29 years old, my oldest daughter was three at the time and my youngest was a little over a year old. My hubby was going through some medical issues that we were trying to get down to the bottom of. Little did I know at the time it would take us two years to finally get a medical diagnosis and a plan to treat him. But during this time, my husband had gone through so many tests and doctors only to get no answers. Well, again, when I was 29 on the particular night, I remember being at my lowest and so sad and not knowing where to turn. My husband wasn't doing well, and my youngest daughter was also sick that night, but just typical little kid things. So after I put my girls to bed and my hubby was asleep in bed, I came out to the living room, sat down on the couch, and just started talking to God. I was talking out loud to him as if he were in the same room with me. As I sat there talking to God with tears in my eyes, I felt as if I were being held in someone's arms, like someone was giving me a big bear hug. I suddenly felt very tired and sleep just came over me very fast. So I thanked God for listening to me and said goodnight and went to bed. That night, I had the most wondrous dream ever. My dream didn't seem like a dream to me. It felt very real in every aspect. In my dream, I found myself on a beautiful mountainside next to a babbling stream. I could hear the running water of the stream in my dream. The colors of the mountainside were so brilliant, they just stood out. I felt utter peace, calm, tranquility, and love. I didn't have a care in the world at this place. When I turned my head to look around, I found animals sitting next to me, all kinds of them. They were just sitting there next to me. Then all of a sudden, I heard my name called by a man's voice. It was the most beautiful sounding voice I have ever heard. I looked up because I was sitting down. When I looked up, I saw the face of Jesus surrounded by a golden light. He had the most bluest eyes I've ever seen and the biggest, kindest smile I could ever imagine. I was in utter shock that I couldn't find my voice for a moment. He took that time to sit down right next to me. He reached over and took my hand in his and smiled at me. I looked at him and just couldn't believe what I was seeing. As if he were reading my mind, he just laughed and smiled at me more. He then said to me, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. I'm here for you. I was speechless. But then I finally found my voice and asked, but why me? Surely there are bigger and better people than me. He laughed again, and the laugh was the sweetest sound I ever heard. He told me that he was there for me because I've always put people before me and wanted to let me know that he was there for me. I then remembered that I had forgotten to pray for my sister-in-law that night, and before I could even say a word, he said my sister-in-law was going to be okay as well as for everything I prayed for before I went to sleep. I then woke up the next day with such a sense of peace and love that I just can't put it into words. Now, I know there are people out there that think that I may have made all of this up in my imagination, but I can assure you I did experience all of this. That experience has stayed with me ever since it happened. I did share it with a reverend of our local church. He thinks that I did indeed get a, a, uh, receive a visit from Jesus, but I should be careful with it. Not sure what he meant, but I will always treasure it. With that being shared, I've also had my fair share of paranormal experiences. I truly believe in both. I know you share your emails with your listeners, and I'm okay if you want to share this. I just ask no one judge me too hard. Thank you so much for letting me share this very truly personal experience with you. Thanks again. Hugs, Jane. I don't know if I could if I could end tonight on a, on a better story. Did not plan it that way at all. I went from the oldest to the newest emails. This one came in just yesterday. Jane, wow, what an amazing story. And I think I know what your pastor meant when he said that you need to be careful. Um, because so, so many people would take this and immediately think, Jesus took me to heaven. He showed me exactly what heaven's going to be like. And we, we can't know that. 
We can't know that. It was just a dream. He, he, and granted, God does speak to us through dreams. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. I'm not saying that he always does, but he can. Acts 2.17, your sons and daughters will speak what God has revealed. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. So yeah, God does speak to us through dreams once in a while. So I, I don't doubt that at all. But you can't necessarily say, this is exactly what Jesus said to me. You know, you can't do a thus saith the Lord type of thing. You don't want to, you don't want to put yourself in the, <laughs> in the, uh, in the shoes of being a false prophet. You know, you can't call yourself a prophet for that. But yeah, you know, then the way you were describing that though, I said that, that sounds like heaven to me. Uh, the beautiful surroundings like that, the animals living together, you know, the lion, the lion and the lamb that by the way, which is not in the Bible, uh, that was actually in last in last week's Church of the Undead. Uh, that the lion and the lambs together isn't in there, but the 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 the, uh, the wolf and the lamb lying together. The whole the whole point is there are no there's no prey. You know, there's no um, there's there's no uh, prey and predator situation when it when it's in heaven. And I do believe that that animals will be in heaven. I I truly do believe that. I, I think that's that's part of. Uh, you know, what the, what, when the Bible's talking about all the animals living together in harmony like that, I think I, I think heaven is going to be that way. So when people ask about their pets, why not? Yeah, I, if, if animals are going to be there anyway, why not have our pets there? If it's something that we truly loved and heaven is all about love, why not have that, have, you know, our, our, the pets that we loved there? So, uh, Jane, that, that is really great. I really appreciate that. Um, folks, that's the, that's the last uh, email. If you want to email me your paranormal story, uh, you can send me true stories or uh, fictional stories. The fictional stories will be used in a uh, in a future like like maybe Friday frights that I'm hoping to bring back soon, or like a, or maybe a Thriller Thursday. If it's a true story though, I share it right here on Fireside Frights. You can email me. Just go to well, just email Darren at WeirdDarkness.com. That Darren again is D-A-R-R-E-N, and uh, I'm going to leave you to, to uh, with with this uh, Isaiah 40 verse 29. The Lord, the everlasting God, gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. And a final thought from Simone Wheel: To be always relevant, you have to say things which are eternal. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this Fireside Frights episode of Weird Darkness. I am Sir George, possessor of the magic sword. By its powers, I will lead you on the seven great adventures, each one mightier than the other. Hey, weirdos. Our August Weirdo Watch Party is Saturday, August 5th, with a movie presented by a perfectly named horror host show, The Weirdness Really Bad Movie with Dave Binkley. Dave will be presenting 1962's dreck of a film, The Magic Sword, starring Basil Rathbone. And trust me, Rathbone is the only good part about this movie. The son of a sorceress armed with weapons and armor assisted by six magically summoned knights embarks on a quest to save a princess from a vengeful wizard. That's right, it's not just an awful movie, it's an awful historically incorrect period piece movie. You got a two-headed fire-breathing dragon, cursed shrunken people, a giant ogre that looks like a guy in a werewolf costume, a wicked and ugly witch, you'll see the Coneheads from Saturday Night Live. Well, they look that way at least. You've got dated special effects, terrible acting, and costumes that look like they were ripped right out of a Monty Python skit. The Weirdo Watch Party is always free to watch online with all of us, so grab your popcorn, candy, and soda and jump into the fun and even get involved in the live chat as we watch the movie. It's The Magic Sword presented by The Weirdness Really Bad Movie Show, Saturday, August 5th, starting at 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central, 8 p.m. Mountain, 7 p.m. Pacific. See a trailer for the film and invite your friends to watch along with you on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. And we'll see you on Saturday, August 5th for the Weirdo Watch Party. Bonus points if you're wearing your Renaissance Festival costume while watching. When Salem Roanoke took a job near his family's new home as a hired hand in the Texas Hill Country, he anticipated learning the rancher's trade, but a series of strange events shocking murders and unholy revelations divert him down another path. This terrifying trajectory puts him directly into the middle of a struggle between monsters, magic, and men. 
Armed and backed by a militia of ranchers, Salem attempts to combat the creeping tide of evil that threatens to engulf his new home and destroy the people most important to him. Will Salem manage to save his home, or have his actions condemn everyone he hopes to save? The Witch Trials – A Summer of Wolves and Season of the Witch by S. R. Roanoke Available in paperback, Kindle, and audiobook versions. Look for The Witch Trials by S. R. Roanoke on Amazon or find it on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.